Good morning. We're ready to call, the, I think we're ready to call the meeting to order. Ms. Davis, if you would please call the roll. Good morning, Chairman Vasquez. Good morning. Vice Chair Schaefer. This is uh, Vice, Chair Vice Chair Schaefer, present. Good morning. Member Gaines. Present. Member Cohen. Here, present. Deputy Controller Stowers. I believe she's going to join us a little bit later. Okay. So a quorum is present. So uh, the board meeting is now called back to order. Uh, members, just a reminder that all of you and the invited speakers are simultaneously on a shared open teleconference call line and patience is needed to keep the audio clean and clear. Please ask for the, your turn to speak after each presentation has concluded so the transcriptionists will clearly hear and properly record the meeting. Ms. Davis, please announce our first order of business. Can you look up? Our first order of business today is Meeting 2023 today is an announcement from Acting Chief of Board Proceedings, Henry Nanjo, regarding public teleconference participation. Mr. Nanjo, are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you very much, Ms. Davis. Good morning, and thank you for joining today's Board of Equalization meeting via teleconference. Throughout the duration of today's meeting, you will be primarily in a listen-only mode. As you may know from our public agenda notice and our website, we have requested that individuals who wish to make a public comment fill out the public comment submission form found on our additional information webpage in advance of today's meeting, or alternatively, participate in today's meeting by providing your public comment live. After the presentation of an item has concluded, we will begin by identifying any public comment, re public comment requests that have been received by our board proceeding staff with the ATT operator providing directions for you to identify yourself. After all known public commenters have been called, the operator will provide public comment instructions to the, individu to the individuals participating via teleconference. Accordingly, if you intend to make a public comment today, we recommend dialing into the meeting on the teleconference line as the audio broadcast for our website experiences a one to three minute delay. When giving a public comment, please limit your remarks to three minutes. We ask that everyone who is not intending to make a public comment, please mute their line or minimize background noise. If there are technical difficulties when we are in the public comment portion of our meeting, we will do our best to read submitted comments into the record at the appropriate times. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Ms. Davis, Chairman Vasquez, back to you. Thank you. Ms. Davis, please call our first item. Mr. Chair. Yes. Good morning to everyone. Good morning, colleagues. Malia here. Um, before we call our next item, may I, may I make a few opening remarks very briefly just to acknowledge yesterday's board meeting? Sure, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, uh, I just first uh, want to thank the um, I want to thank the presenters um, for those that stepped up and shared with us the valuable and and provided meaningful, thoughtful uh, discussion uh, with things that we might want to consider in providing universal guidance for Assessment Appeals Board and assessors as we begin to move forward uh, their business continuity plans. And Mr. Chair, I credit you for pulling all this together yesterday. I think it was a huge um, uplift for our effort. And uh, when we lead the effort for the board to support the AABs by asking the governor, um, I uh, wanted asking the governor to extend the statute of limitations on cases that were running up against their tolling date, I believe that it's the right thing to do. We touched very briefly on it yesterday. Um, and after a unanimous vote by my colleagues, thank you, uh, the chair sent a letter to the governor on our behalf and worked hard regarding the need to obtain some relief for AABs and taxpayers. 
and I just want to acknowledge my staff and I were able to partner with you on that to make this process move forward smoothly. I would just want you to know that um, that the uh, that, you, that the chair had to work with the legislature and the governor's office to get this done. And many of our AABs, our assessors, and, and even Assessor Stone yesterday, they've expressed concern about the extension provided. You heard that in, in the commentary. Well, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, the initial executive order rep represented what we were able to achieve at this time during this pandemic. Um, also want to point out the huge lift that Brenda Fleming and her executive team also con who they how they contributed greatly to making this uh, this um, a fruitful effort. However, I just want to just note that there's a little bit of concern about our business continuity plans that I want to flag for us possibly if we can discuss uh, at some point today. Um, what I'm curious to know like what our steps we're taking. Uh, to ramp up and continue our work during the pandemic. I think the reality is, is that we're going to be sheltering in place, certainly to the end of possibly as early as, as, as the spring of 2021. Um, and the discussion yesterday was, um, and, 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 and today will help us on the journey, help us figure out this pathway. So Chair, I want to just thank you and acknowledge and uplift your leadership on this work. I also want to just affirm that I'm here to help and um, lend my staff as well to any time and also want to acknowledge the governor and his team who may or may not be listening i don't know but they were also really significant in helping us pull this together and then there's senior leadership within the legislature that were also helpful um in getting the executive order done so it was a full team effort uh senator um Gaines, you know about how, how how all these entities and all these pieces all work together and i just wanted to give a little bit of praise because it was a heavy lift and it was difficult, but our chair did it. And um, we are, I think, in a stronger place and we were great advocates on behalf of our assessors. And I look forward as we go through in this meeting today to continue to move in that vein so that we have that, um, we are moving with that sense of urgency, but also being very helpful and also demonstrating our, <laughs> the critical position that we play in state government which is not always on the forefront, but I think this has given us an opportunity to really step up. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to just, just express this. Um, thank you to the BOE staff, the executive staff, Brenda Fleming and her team. Incredible work, impeccable. That's it, thank you. Thank you. And thank you to your staff as well. Uh, with that, Ms. Davis, if you can please call the first item. The first item on today's agenda is in one public comments for items not on the agenda. We have received public comments that need to be read into the record. Mr. Henry Nanjo and Mr. and Ms. Lisa Renati will read the comments. Mr. Nanjo and Ms. Renati, are you available and ready? Yes, we are. And Ms. Renati is going to read the first two comments. Ms. Renati, are you available? I'm sorry. Um, the comment. Just a second. I'm having a technical problem. Not a problem. Ms. Renati, why don't I go ahead and read the first one? And you can take the second one. Henry, please proceed. Okay. Um, first comment is. Quote, the assessor Larry Stone is purposefully sabotaging the work of employees in the office of the assessor and in essence holding the county hostage. At the 8-18-2020 Assessment Appeals Board meeting, Greg Monteverdi, assistant assessor, read a statement saying that the CEO rejected the assessor's plan to bring staff back well, into Leah, the Leah, just dropped your mouth. <laughs> Therefore, uh, I'm going to continue. Therefore, the assessor will be not be presenting a she case. Was Value comments. Sir. Mr. Schaefer, I think you need to mute your mic. I'm sorry, Nadja, go ahead. Yes. Um, then the value hearing officer asked if the assessor's office would like a continuance, and Greg Monteverde st stated no. This meant that the taxpayer appealing his property tax value would get a default win and the value of the property would be less than if the assessor's office presented its case, resulting in a loss of property tax revenue to the county. This is a complete public failure of the assessor to perform his elected duties. Due to the dereliction of duty of Larry Stone, I urge this board to immediately make assessment appeal board hearings 
held via teleconference and canceled until this can be arranged. This should, the board should also investigate the fitness for duty of Larry Stone. I'll, I'll go ahead and read the next public comment as well. Uh, the next public comment states, quote, um, honorable board members, I wish to alert you about an alarming situation unfolding, uh, fo excuse me, unfolding at the assessor's office in Santa Clara County, where I work as an appraiser. Ever since the count, our county implemented a shelter in place order in mid-March, our office of 250 employees has largely been working from home. Certain essential functions were still performed in the office and those who preferred to come in were still allowed to, but most of the work was being done at home. Under these extraordinary circumstances, we managed to close the assessment roll of $551 billion. In many cases, we found ourselves more productive, completing more assessment activities than during the same time period the year before. For real property assessments alone, we completed 99.63% of all activities, a new record in our office. But late last month, we were made aware of a plan by our assessor, Larry Stone, to bring all teleworking employees back into the office on a rotational basis. The plan, which he developed unilaterally without input from staff, would have placed as many as 25 employees on one floor of the office at a time. All this while Santa Clara reports around 200 new cases of COVID-19 per day. And most public and private organizations are still largely teleworking including other departments in Santa Clara County and other assessor offices in large counties throughout the state, close print. Thankfully, after over 150 members of our office raised objections, the assessor's reckless plan was rejected by the county executive. However, the assessor was so incensed by the county executive's decision that he resorted to the nuclear option and closed the offices to all employees except senior managers. Consequently, some essential functions that we depend on will not be able to be performed. Roll corrections can't be made because nobody can mail the notices. If all our computers break down, if, excuse me, if our computers break down, we can't get them fixed and we will need to take leave because Assessor Stone has barred all IT personnel from the premises. Assessment appeals cannot be defended because we're not allowed to be present at hearings, resulting in an automatic win for applicants. In short, because Assessor Stone did not get his way, his new strategy is to intentionally impede his own employees' workflow so that he can turn around and tell the public that teleworking has a detrimental impact on the assessment role production. He's putting his thumb on the scale to get the results that support his narrative, holding schools and essential services hostage in order to fulfill his own short-sighted prophecy. He admitted as much in a recent San Jose Spotlight article, quote, if I'm prevented from deploying my staff the way I need to get my job done, then I'll let them know how much money we left on the table. I'll let school boards and the cities and everyone who depends on property tax revenue know what happened, unquote. In the same article, he dismissed our concerns as lies and implied that our desire to continue to work from home was more out of laziness than concern for personal safety. We cannot afford to participate in the assessor's dangerous and potentially deadly game of chicken. My colleagues and I just want to do our jobs in a safe, supportive environment. Our issue was always about safety and following the county directive to telework whenever possible. I am leaving this comment because I want to assure the members of the board and the public that in spite of the assessor's interference, my colleagues and I will continue about our work with efficiency and professionalism that we have shown over the last five months. I implore our assessor, Larry Stone, to do the same. That's the end of the statement. Thank you. Um, that is all the public statements I have on the end item. Ms. Back Davis, is there any others? Um, at this point, we should have the AT&T operator ask if there are any public comments on matters not on the agenda. And ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to provide a public comment, please press 1, then 0 on your touchtone keypad, and an operator will provide you with a line number. Once again, if you'd like to provide a public comment, please press 1, then 0 at this time. And I have no one in queue to provide public comment. Please continue. And that's complete. Thank you, Chairman Vasquez, um, Ms. Clerk Davis. That completes the end item. Uh, public comments on matters not on the agenda.
Thank you. Ms. Davis, please call our next item. Our next item of the day is M1B, Examination of Business, Continuity, Plans, Challenges, Opportunities, Lessons Learned, and Perspectives for Discussion and Possible Action. This item will be presented by Chairman Vasquez. Thank you. Members, as I mentioned during yesterday's meeting, with the impact of COVID-19 closing access to county buildings and hearing rooms, we took steps to extend the AAB's two-year deadline, both directly and through the governor. The current extended deadline expires on January 31st, 2021. Since the closure may continue for some time after that, the purpose of this hearing is to receive input and recommendations on how AABs can conduct hearings remotely and at the same time ensure due process and protect the rights of all parties. We scheduled several speakers to address three separate items for the top for this topic listed as A, B, and C on the agenda. Due to the governor's directives to reduce energy demand and close state offices at 3 p.m. starting Monday through today, we addressed only item A yesterday and will continue with item B and C today. To stay within the time available, I will ask everyone to ex everyone except the board members to reserve your questions or comments until all speakers on each item are finished. After that, we will allow time for public questions and comments. With that, we're gonna move into, we actually have four speakers coming up and we broke it up into four areas. The urban counties, which will have four speakers on that. The mid-sized counties, we should, we'll have three speakers on. The rural counties, and we'll have one speaker representing that. And then we'll close it out with the taxpayers. And we have two speakers for that. We have four speakers. The first one will be Ms. Jennifer Tran, Chief Assessment Appeals Division Executive Office of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. Welcome, Ms. Tran. Are you available? Yes, I am. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Good morning. Good morning. So my name is Jennifer Tran. I'm the Assistant Chief over LA County Assessment Appeals Board. The COVID-19 pandemic has required many services provided by the county to evolve in order to protect the health, safety, and well-being of the public and our workforce, and further to ensure accessibility to our most vulnerable communities. As one of our the most diverse and populous jurisdictions in the nation, the volume of our AAB applications by comparison exceeds all other jurisdictions within the state of California. Based on a two year average, we received nearly 18,000 applications with approximately 23,000 parcels annually. During 2019 filing year, LA County scheduled nearly 39,000 applications for board and hearing officer hearings. On March 16th, in response to the LA County Board of Supervisors directive to close all county facilities, the LA County AAB postponed hearings for over 4,000 applications <coughs> and received postponement requests from applicants for over 5,000 applications. Then in early April, AAB began to conduct administrative hearings using WebEx. To date, we have conducted 31 administrative hearings for approximately 2,500 applications. On August 4, 2020, the LA County Board of Supervisors directed the executive officer of the board in consultation with County Council to explore modernizing AAB system to augment in-person hearings with virtual hearing options using current technologies that will allow due process for the parties. Once AAB implements virtual hearings, we will provide a streamlined notification process, which includes email notification and mailing of the hearing appointment card to the taxpayer and or tax agent at least 45 days prior to the hearing date. Hearing agendas and dial-in information 
will be accessible through our public website to allow the public attend telephonically and will remain muted during the hearing. Now, I would like to introduce Amin al Muhajab, the Chief Information Officer for LA County Board of Supervisors Executive Office to further discuss the infrastructure and IT resources for implementation to support AAB's virtual hearings. Thank you, Jennifer. This is Amin. Good morning to you all. I'm very delighted to share with you the Los Angeles County Assessment Appeals Board's business continuity plan, which includes recovery of services during and post pandemic scenarios, as well as the next normal. We have been working to um, modernize services and implement virtual conferencing technology to conduct virtual hearings. The Executive Office of the Board of Supervisors is working on the acquisition and implementation of the following solutions to meet AAB's business requirements. The plan is broken into four sections. The first one is infrastructure and facility preparation. Each assessment appeals board hearing room will be fully equipped for virtual and in-person hearings, including enhanced wireless and cell services coverage, video conferencing systems, teleconferencing and audio recording services, large presentation screens, document digitization capabilities, and of course, COVID-19 uh, safety measures. The second section is telework equipment and enablement. Each assessment appeals board member will be provided with the following equipment, laptops with built-in cameras and microphones, large supplemental monitors, headphones, productivity software and tools to perform daily tasks. The third section is service management system. We have standardized on WebEx virtual meeting platform, which supports virtual lobby or waiting room, among other features. It also supports streaming to social media platforms. We are also developing an online evidence submission portal, which integrates with our case management and document sharing systems. The fourth section we refer to as the service operation expectation. This includes full video and audio remote conferencing capabilities, along with visual presentation. We are developing training materials, operational support mechanisms, procedures, and easy to follow how to infographic instructions. Constituents can join virtual meetings using smart devices remotely. However, constituents without smart devices can visit a designated area at AEB to join the virtual meeting. We are working on digital evidence collaboration and sharing capabilities with uh, 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 various stakeholders, such as uh, taxpayers, tax agents, attorneys, and assessor. We are streamlining identity and service access management. Our future approach is to encourage virtual meetings to minimize physical presence, to ensure the safety of our workforce, customers, and the public. The goal is to maximize the use of emergent technologies to deliver efficient services. This concludes the update. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have our third speaker, which uh, is Ms. Uh, actually, Ms. Marvies Masick, Chief Deputy Clerk of the San Diego County Board of Supervisors. Is Ms. Masick available? I'm available. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the board. My name is Marvise Masick. I am the Chief Deputy Clerk of the Board of Supervisors for the County of San Diego. Um, we implemented virtual assessment appeal hearings in May 2020 for administrative matters and in July 2020 for evidentiary matters. Uh, Chair Vasquez, I, I'm having trouble hearing the speaker, please. This is Vice Chair Schaefer. Yes, Ms. Basic, are you able to raise your voice a little bit? Are you able to hear me better now? Yes, that's very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll, I'll back up a little bit. So we implemented virtual assessment appeals hearings in May 2020 for administrative matters and in July 2020 for evidentiary matters. 
These measures aligned with our department's continuity of operations plan to continue to provide core services to the public. The County of San Diego currently has received approximately 8,000 assessment appeal cases since 2018, representing about 5,900 parcels. Of those 8,000 appeals, 4,600 are currently active and 800 are approaching their two-year deadline. To date, we have held virtual hearings for two administrative agendas, two residential hearing agendas, one commercial hearing agenda, and two special hearing agendas. Our agendas average about 200 cases, with majority of those cases being stipulations and requests for a reset of hearing. We have conducted 31 evidentiary virtual hearings. With the implementation of virtual assessment appeal hearings, changes to our business processes included ensuring that all of our board members were able to access our virtual platform, Zoom, um, revising noticing, um, creation of a waiver of in-person hearing form for appellants, Zoom trainings and rehearsals for clerk of the board staff, assessment appeals board members, and assessors staff, and the implementation of receiving exhibits no later than 72 hours prior to the start of the appeal hearing. Um, the most significant process change has been the acceptance of exhibits prior to the start of the hearing. Our staff receive the exhibits electronically and by mail and distribute them to all parties, which include board members, assessors, staff, and the appellant within 24 hours of the hearing. Also, any exhibits that are provided during the hearing, which is at the discretion of the chair, are emailed to the board members during the hearing for consideration. This was the greatest challenge at the inception of the evidentiary virtual hearing process. Um, many times we found that exhibits were received either right before the start of the hearing or during the hearing itself. Um, we plan to continue to operate using virtual hearings for the foreseeable future. We believe that conducting virtual hearings helps to ensure that there is less of a bottleneck down the line when it is time for cases to be processed and ensures property owners' um, appeals are heard timely. Uh, we have had seven virtual hearings since May 7, 2020. Of course, we're still um, learning lessons and um, processes are still being tweaked as we discover what works and what does not. However, um, one thing that would assist our process would be having consistent statewide guidelines for virtual hearings, particularly in terms of timelines for submitted exhibits. Right now, I know each county is attempting to share best practices with each other and piece together procedures for use, so statewide guidelines would provide us with consistency in this process. Um, subject to any questions that your board may have, that concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you for that very helpful information. Uh, <clears throat> with that, let's move on to our fourth speaker. Uh, Mr. Uh, oh, Chair, I'm sorry. Uh, Vice Chair Schaefer here. Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask Ms. Uh, Masick, you mentioned that there were uh, 800 applicants that were pending the uh, uh, two year, uh, approaching our two year deadline. Will we be able to take care of all those within the two years? Yes, some of those cases um, have been reset, while others um, we're attempting to obtain waivers for. Um, but it is always our, our um, we are always looking to make sure that we get those cases completed within or at least prior to the two-year deadline. Thank you. Thank you. Question, if I could. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, I uh, appreciate this uh, background and the questions asked by my colleague, Mr. Schaefer, and just wanted to dig into it a little bit more in terms of the 800 cases uh, that uh, could expire. Um, so I just want to clarify that the extension that's allowed through uh, January 31st by the governor, uh, is that helping you in terms of making sure that those cases are heard? That does. Um, those cases are active, but as I said, there are a number of cases that either we have been able to obtain a waiver for or we've been able to reset um, to provide that um, app appellant with a little bit more time. Um, but all of our cases to date, we have not had any um, go beyond that two-year deadline. Yes, okay. 
All right. And so would that help perhaps other cases, the extension? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Every, every yeah. little bit does help. Excellent. Okay. That's great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll go on to uh, our fourth speaker. If Ms. Carol Ruart, Deputy City Attorney, City and County of San Francisco, is she available? Yes. And welcome back uh, to the Board of Equalization, Ms. Ruart. I understand you used to work for us uh, for several years. That, that is true. I had the privilege of serving as a tax counsel with the State Board's legal department and for two District 1 board members. Welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be virtually back. Um, again, my name is Carol Ruart. I am a Deputy City Attorney with the San Francisco City Attorney's Office. I took that position after I left the State Board of Equalization. And in that capacity, I've represented our Assessor's Office at Assessment Appeals for nine years. I'm here today to share with the board issues and observations about remote hearings. As background, San Francisco has three assessment appeals boards, as well as hearing officers for small property valuation appeals only. All legal issues, including change in ownership, are heard by the three appeals boards. San Francisco receives a wide range of appeals annually, and the types of appeals depend on the real estate market. When the market's on an upswing, there are more commercial and business property appeals, but during a downturn, there's a lot of appeals filed for single-family residences, condos, townhomes, co-ops, and residential properties of four units or less generally. There are usually about 10 to 25 requests for interpreters, depending on the market. As of July 31st, 2020, the San Francisco Appeals Board has 1,443 total open appeals. At this same time last year, there were 766 total open appeals. Of the currently open appeals, a little more than half are represented. The open appeals include 291 hearing officer appeals, that would be the small residential, 96 commercial appeals, 87 hotel appeals, 84 office and office condo appeals. And of course, we have a number of unique property types, church, hospital, convalescent home, arenas, stadiums, etc. A number of scheduled appeals were postponed by the health emergency but there is only one set of appeals with the same taxpayer that has a two-year deadline expiring in December. The board's goal is to begin remote hearings in November 2020, but according to the board clerk, it would be an accomplishment if 10 hearings were able to be held by the end of the year. The board has told us that hearing officer hearings are more informal and the documents are straightforward, so the San Francisco Board expects these to be able to proceed as with in-person hearings. Full board hearings are expected to be more complex with document distribution during the hearing to be a significant challenge has been, has been mentioned by many previous speakers. I'd like to start by emphasizing that the San Francisco Assessor's Office led by Assessor Carmen Chu strongly supports remote hearing procedures that provide applicants with a full and fair opportunity to present their cases, to understand the assessor's position and be assured that the board has heard them. We believe that one size will not fit all counties or even all taxpayers. We also believe that the state board has two important roles. One, to collect and make best practices available to all counties and taxpayers. And two, to take legal, regulatory, and advisory action to ensure the following items. Appropriate uniformity among the counties, to ensure there's as much similarity as possible between in-person and remote hearings, and that counties are protected from litigation over how remote hearings are held. The major challenges we see relate to three broad categories, equity of technology access, handling of documents, and making the record of the hearing. In terms of equity of technology access, I heard that previous comments were made about the need for hearing procedures to be flexible as we navigate these new methods, and we certainly agree. But we also believe that county boards should err on the side of providing more information on the actual process. Do not assume that individual taxpayers know about the technology or assessment appeal hearings generally. There should be clear step-by-step -step directions for every step of the hearing, including the waiting room, the opening of the hearing, the swearing in, the order of appearances, the portions of hearings not open to the public, 
the use of the translators, and the conclusion of the hearing. We believe the State Board can help all counties by compiling county, county procedures and recommending best practices. One example of a technology access issue is where a taxpayer would appear by audio only. A county board might not have the same ability as at an in-person hearing to assess credibility. Communication may not be as clear. This could raise due process issues that a self-represented taxpayer would not even be aware of. But even if taxpayers are required to appear by video, then different equity issues arise. Does the taxpayer have a strong internet connection and a quiet space? If they're using a cell phone, do they have sufficient data in their package? Can a county provide facilities for applicants to use for their hearings? What issues does that raise? These have been raised by a number of speakers and we concur. One issue that we think is important is that the parties themselves to a hearing need to be able to confer amongst themselves confidentially. We sometimes call these sidebars. This is important sometimes to maintain attorney-client privilege. Sometimes a principal appraiser needs to support a staff appraiser or a representative needs to talk to their taxpayer. This is an essential characteristic of in-person hearings that should be provided for remote hearings as well. We also believe that clear procedures for addressing connection problems are vital. For example, a best practice would be to have a dedicated phone or text number direct to the board clerk that does not rely on an inter internet connection. We believe that it would be very helpful for the state board to be a clearinghouse for county remote hearing procedures. For example, a best practice could be that every county board has a web page indicator of their in-person and remote hearing practices. But the state board could post a list of these links just as it provides all county assessor information. In terms of handling documents, we agree with previous speakers that this is a significant challenge. Unlike trial courts with discovery, the legal framework for AAB hearings does not contemplate complete pre-hearing document sharing between the parties. For example, at in-person hearings, each party determines which documents are submitted into evidence as the hearing progresses. I've heard many taxpayer representatives say that making their case on their terms is an important element of due process for them. Our assessor believes that this should be available in remote hearings as well. Also, the legal framework and in-person hearing practice as it has evolved also contemplates that each party may provide additional documents in, resp in response to points raised. This is the rebuttal document um, issue that was raised yesterday. We believe this should be accommodated in remote hearings to minimize continuances. The ability to submit additional new documents during the hearing is especially important for self-represented taxpayers. They bring folders of odd-sized materials to the hearing. They may not know which ones to submit in advance. It's also important in complex appeals where a new point may be raised that could be addressed with additional documentation. But if this is not allowed or is easy, then the parties might overload their pre-hearing submissions packets with anything they could possibly want to use or there could be multiple continuances. Assuming the evidence is not distributed in advance to the parties, distribution by email during the hearing could be difficult for board members and parties. Reviewing significant documents and participating in the hearing on only one screen would be even more difficult for a party participating by cell phone. We think this would raise equity issues for many individual taxpayers. And county boards would need to establish clear criteria for the size and format of documents that are within the limits of individual taxpayer email accounts and hardware. We also see a legal issue. Will taxpayers be able to obtain the assessor's documents after they are submitted to a county board in advance of the hearing? under Section 408 of the Revenue and Taxation Code? Would the assessor be able to obtain the taxpayer's documents as well? We believe the State Board should address this uniformly for all counties by a rule or legislation. With respect to making the record of the hearing, Revenue and Taxation Code Section 1611 requ requires the County Board to record, report, or videotape each hearing, while Rule 312 requires the county board to make available to any person for purchase an audio recording or transcript. Given this legal framework, what is the official record of the hearing and what is provided for the purchase? Some issues we see are these. At an in-person hearing in San Francisco, voices are recorded, but generally not images. Also, while the hearing is open to the public, only the public that is in the room can view the proceedings. Should a taxpayer, assessor, or board member be able to refuse to be visible for a remote hearing? And are there issues with respect to archiving of those hearing tapes? 
In an in-person hearing, sidebar chats can be made off record. We strongly believe this capability should extend to remote hearings, as mentioned before. Even if a hearing is held on video, should the record available for purchase remain audio or transcript as provided in Rule 312? We urge the board, the state board to address these issues at a statewide level to ensure that all counties treat the same kinds of recordings similarly and are protected from litigation that could invalidate the results of remote hearings. In conclusion, San Francisco strongly supports remote hearings. We urge the state board to take legislative, regulatory, and advisory action to ensure consistency among the counties and certainty for taxpayers. Thank you for the opportunity to share San Francisco's observations, concerns, and possible solutions. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Members, are there any questions? Yeah, Vice Chair uh, Schaefer here. Yes, go ahead, Vice Chair. Uh, uh, Ma'am, uh, you mentioned earlier that there were uh, 25 requests for interpreters. Were those uh, uh, Asian language to English, uh, Spanish? Uh, could you, do you have a breakdown of what the, how the 25 uh, are classified? I don't have that information in hand. Um, the only information I have is that generally in, in the down market, because there are more residential appeals, there are more requests for interpreters. I personally have observed at least three to four different um, primary languages um, brought in by taxpayers, um, but I'm sure that there are more. Well, I, I hear that there are 200 languages that are used within the jurisdiction, and uh, uh, we just tend to assume that most of them are, are Spanish because that's our largest uh, population base of language, but uh, I'm willing to be educated. I have personally observed most of the, the taxpayers I have observed, and granted, I do not go to even close to most of the hearings um, as assessor's counsel, um, but I have uh, most frequently observed Asian languages as the primary taxpayer um, language that requests interpretation or uses interpretation. And, and that includes not just requesting it of the board, but perhaps they bring a family member who assists in the process. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, question of our good Chair Vasquez. This is yes, uh, Chair Gaines. And I'm just wondering if uh, the participants uh, from LA, San Diego, and San Francisco could uh, speak a little bit about the uh, backlog prior to the pandemic and now, I, I think uh, Ms. Ruart um, has already brought that up. I think it was 1443 for 2020 versus 766, if I understood correctly, but either expand on that. And if I could hear from the other two counties, that would be helpful. Are they available? I've given you all the information. I, I This is Carol Ruart from San Francisco. I've given you all yeah. the information that I happen to have on that. Okay. Very well, thank you. Good, and then can we hear from uh, San Diego and LA County too? Hello, this is Jennifer from LA County. As of yesterday, our backlog, we have about 9,800 open applications with 15,368 parcels. Okay, and do you know what that was prior to the pandemic or last year? I don't have the information or the data with me at hand, but I okay. can always provide that afterwards. Yeah, that'd be helpful if you wouldn't mind it. And I'm assuming it's gone up dramatically. Is that a, a, an accurate assumption? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Okay, very well, thank you. And then um, how about San Diego? San Diego, same. The current active cases are about 4,600 that we have. Okay. And do you know what it was last year? The number of cases last year were about a little over 4,000 that we received last year. Yeah, okay, all right, all right, good. Excellent, and um, to the other, to both San Diego and LA, uh, to what degree has the executive order provided relief of those cases?
through the extension. Um, this is Marvis with San Diego County. Um, it's, it's helped us in those cases that were reset during that time period of March to March to about July, where we were unable to hear those cases. We proactively set cases that are um, at 120 days of their expiration date. So we had some cases that were set on an okay. agenda that were unable to be heard. Um, so it has helped in that sense that we were able to extend those cases out a bit until we were able to implement the virtual hearing process. Okay, very well. That's great. Thank you. And uh, LA County? This is I'm Thomas sorry, Parker you... from. Go ahead, Jennifer. I'm sorry, I was going to ask if you can please repeat the question. Yeah, I was just uh, trying to get clarity on how much help uh, the executive order from the governor has helped. And, um, it, you know, when uh, we heard from Ms. Uh, Mazik uh, with San, San Diego, deputy clerk from San Diego, she indicated that it was helping for cases within that time frame. And uh, so I'm just trying to figure out how effective is the executive order in terms of the, um, the extension of time and uh, this, how that's impacting each of the counties. Well, as of, um, we ran our numbers. Um, as of today, we have 366 applications that will be expiring without waivers um, at the end of this year. And that includes uh, 570 parcels, but we also have additional uh, 381 applications that will be expiring June of 2021. So it did, it, it, may, it will be helpful. It is helpful for the 366 applications that will be expiring for in, at the end of this year. However, we are also um, have additional applications that we need to consider. And I, I, I believe um, Tom Parker, our county council can expand on that as well. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Chair Vasquez, uh, Chair Vice Chair Schaefer here. Uh, yes, we were, I think we we're waiting for a response from the Mr. Parker. Yes, okay. And then we'll, we'll get to you, Vice Chair. Mr. Parker there. Okay, as we wait for Mr. Parker, um, Mr. Gaines, I just want to point out that the executive order, like all executive orders, um, address the immediate need. Um, the governors continue to provide additional relief as needed. Yes. Yeah, that's that was my understanding. I'm just, just trying to get a, a sense of um, how it's impacting the counties. And uh, it sounds like it's working. I, my impression is that uh, we don't have cases that are uh, expiring and not being heard. And, True. Uh, yeah, and it was my understanding that we would be in communication with the administration uh, in the event that an extension is, is needed beyond January 31st. So Yeah, uh, actually, that's why this conversation is really helpful. I ho hope county council is available. Is he there? Is he there? Mr. Doesn't sound like it. We might have lost. Well, that's yeah. that's helpful. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to ask those questions. It's a lot clearer in my mind. Thanks. I think what we're focusing on now is our plans to continue, right? We're trying to build an argument like, thank you for the executive order, but now we, we actually need to continue and hear the reasons why. So we have um, compelling arguments to, to go before the governor, to go before the legislator, um, and, and, you know, so that's where we are. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think Mr. Schaefer wants to speak now. Yes. Vice Chair? Yes, so Vice Chair Schaefer here. Uh, I had a question for uh, Chief Deputy Clerk uh, Isaac in San Diego. Uh, there was a reference to 25 requests for interpreters in San Francisco, which uh, several were Asian language. Uh, 
do we have a request for interpreters on our hearings in uh, I mean, San Francisco? In San Diego, do we have some uh, requests for interpreters uh, generally? And uh, uh, do we have any Asian or is it generally Spanish to English? Vice Chair, um, at this time, I am not aware of any requests for interpreter services. If there were a request, we would uh, have them available just like they are readily available every day in the courthouses. If there were requests, we would work with our um, purchasing and contracting department to obtain um, whatever the county or whoever the county um, contracted vendor is for that service. Yes. And they have to give us a certain advance notice, don't they? Like a day or so? Yes, they would need to give us advance notice of the hearing. Okay, I have no further questions. Yeah, Thank, you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you. With that, uh, Mr. Chair, whoops, go ahead. Mr. Chair, I believe that um, we've got Assessor praying on the phone, and uh, I'd like to ask him to uh, address the letter that he emailed to us yesterday. If he could address that uh, just on the record and walk us through. Is Mr. Prang on the line? Ms. Davis, can you ask AT&T to help find Assessor Prang? Yes, AT&T operator, are you available to check to see if Assessor Crane has dialed in as a host? Or anyone from yes. his office? Certainly. And uh, sir, if you're on the line or anyone from your office, please press 1 and 0 or open up your line so you can speak. Okay, so Assessor Prang his, uh, is on the line. We just need to find him. <laughs> uh, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, yes. Yes, there, no, there we go. He was okay. probably muted. <laughs> All right. I, I, was, I was listening, but, uh, and I unmuted, but uh, this is uh, technology doesn't always uh, like me. Um, Not a problem. But, go ahead. Yes, I, so just to uh, give you a little bit about the genesis of that letter, so it... Uh, We're losing you. Included some other speakers, including myself, and I think things were changed. Um, I had prepared some testimony um, that I wanted to submit um, for your consideration, and we didn't want to have to uh, slow you down with having to have it read under under public comment. So I submitted it as a letter just to let you know the thinking of the LA County Assessor's Office as it re relates to uh, remote hearings, something we are uh, 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 Deeply committed to and eager to uh, proceed with, uh, at least from our uh, from our vantage point in LA County. The um, we're concerned um, not only um, based on the, the current uh, uh, environment in the in the uh, with 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 COVID nineteen and our desire to keep not only our employees but members of the public um, safe, but also operationally. I believe there is an incredible opportunity for my agency to uh, uh, enact uh, multiple efficiencies, which could save, from our estimation, millions of dollars in, in personnel, personnel hours and other uh, related costs and provide additional convenience to taxpayers by helping us to uh, expedite the uh, uh, processing of, a, of, of appeals. LA County has, uh, you know, obviously based on our size, has uh, uh, dramatically uh, different levels of, uh, of appeals waiting to be processed. I think that number from, from our perspective is somewhere between 25,000 and 30,000 appeals. We might not have been hearing them for several months. Um, but even uh, pre-COVID, we I've been very concerned about the number of, uh, of appeals and our ability to process them in an expedient uh, manner. And I think that uh, remote hearings or even uh, on a more limited basis, the ability to allow uh, witnesses to testify remotely would be an incredible um, operational efficiency for my department that would have uh, quantifiable benefits. Thank you. With, with that, members. My pleasure. Oh, no, thank you. We all did receive your letter as well. 
So we'll definitely take right. it up at the end as well. Thank you. With that, members, I, I wanted to move into our mid-sized counties, and we have three speakers on the challenges and opportunities of business continuity for these mid-sized counties. And we're going to start with our first speaker, which is Ms. Uh, Kirin Gonzalez, Deputy Clerk for Sonoma County Board of Supervisors. Is Ms. Gonzalez available? I am. Thank you, Chair and Board, for letting me speak today. My name is Kyrene Gonzalez. I am the Deputy Clerk to the Board of Supervisors of Sonoma County. Um, and uh, our, I guess I want to start by echoing many of the challenges that other speakers uh, have, have stated regarding document production, face-to-face -face communications, um, the accessibility for... Uh, you know, technological access to being able to participate in these. The demographics of Sonoma County is approximately 20% of a higher risk, um, which is above the state average. So technology may not always be the easiest uh, form for hearings. That being said, we began remote hearings in May. We've only held two. The first one was administrative only. Uh, the second one was uh, administrative with evidentiary um, uh, document production. We, since 2018, we've had approximately a thousand appeals, and we have approximately four to five hundred active appeals. Uh, I think we only have at this time, uh, we only have two that will be expiring without waivers by the end of the year. That being said, most taxpayers in the area are um, quite compliant with being able to, with, with um, signing appeal waivers uh, for extensions of time. Uh, our business continuity plan has been to um, just not cease, to keep moving forward to hold the hearings. Uh, the challenges have been with those remote, remote hearings have been document production, getting the documentation and the evidence early. We've had to create smaller agendas. So instead of having say 100 administrative review, we're having maybe half that 50 administrative review. Uh, so the agendas have had to be smaller. The length of time just to prep and prepare for these remote hearings. I am the only AAB clerk, uh, so and we only have one AAB. Um, we have three board members and two alternates. We are trying to schedule additional hearings um, throughout the month. We typically only have one per month. We are a mid-sized county. Um, the other challenges have been um, additional additional emergencies where right now Sonoma County is again in a state of emergency. We have fires burning all around us again um, as I speak. And so that's going to, uh, one, put more pressure on the assessor's office to reassess damaged properties, loss, and also going to put more pressure on uh, AAB and the clerk uh, for timing and getting, uh, getting these appeals scheduled. Um, I have had some feedback from taxpayers regarding face-to-face -face communications, making sure that the taxpayers can actually see the board members as opposed to audio only. So we have changed that. We've made sure that any panelist, any participant has, uh, has the ability to have video. Um, I am, as many of us are, I work from home. So our t my technology is... Um, a laptop with a camera, we, I have two screens, uh, um, and the hearings are being facilitated. Uh, I think we lost you. Uh, we have a hearing coming up on August 28th, which shouldn't be, shouldn't be document heavy, but September 11th, we have another hearing that will be very, very, um, uh, heavy in evidence. Getting the documentation early, what we've implemented is a cloud-based system. So taxpayers and assessors, um, I am asking, not requiring because I cannot, asking that documents be be sent to me the when we have our, our hearings on Fridays, 
the Wednesday by five o'clock. So I have all day Thursday to gather the gather the information. I, all of that documentation and evidence is held until the morning of the hearing. At that time, then it is simultaneously sent to all parties, including including the board. So um, it does not prevent anyone from presenting additional evidence during the hearing itself. So um, we have not had to do any screen sharing, and we have, we haven't had to deal with that yet. We uh, all all evidence has been sent to me ahead of time, which has been which has been great. Um, we some of the lessons that we've learned regarding the um, this continuity is that we need we definitely need very very clear concise instructions and time for taxpayers to ask questions ahead of time and the assessor's office to ask questions ahead of time. Um, we need to we 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 assumed we assumed incorrectly that everybody was uh, at least up to par with technology. That is not the case. Um, again, allowing video for participants. Uh, we also have found that it's easier to record the hearings because we didn't have video. We only had audio. Our audio was um, oftentimes um, didn't work very well. Um, we use Zoom as our platform, and it's much easier to record the hearings. Um, our preparations, any, and my preparations for the hearing must start earlier, so that is a challenge, but that's certainly something that I have learned. Uh, I would say overall, most taxpayers and the assessors and the board are quite satisfied and thankful that we are protecting our most vulnerable, that we are moving forward, that the hearings are being held, that we're not having to postpone for various reasons. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, members. Are there any questions? Yeah, I, I have one if I could, Chair. Mr. Gaines? Yeah, I want to thank, thank you, um, Deputy Clerk Gonzalez. Um, can you tell me what's happened to the number of appeal cases prior to the pandemic? I'm just trying to look at that number and how much the number's gone up say from last year to this year? Um, um, the, the, the numbers of appeals that have come in have not really gone up. It's just that okay. we have been in a state of emergency. We had uh, a number of floods. We had PSPSs last year. Many of the hearings were postponed. So we, we received approximately 400 and almost 500 each 2018 and 2019 appeals. Okay. We just have had to do a lot of postponements. Okay. And you've had one to two that have expired? We we have, uh, I believe we have one or two. I think I'm waiting on a, on a hearing waiver extension that will expire by the end of the year uh, without a hearing waiver. But that's cool. it. Okay. Everything, everything else, everything that will be expiring has an attached waiver extension. Yes. Okay. Very well. Good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any other question, members? Hearing none, thank you, Ms. Gonzalez, for your presentation. Thank we'll you. move on. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, Ms. Julie, I believe it's Datchler, Senior Deputy Clerk for Yolo County Board of Supervisors. Is she available? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes, good morning, Chair, members of the board. My name is Julie Dockler, Senior Deputy Clerk for Yolo County. Um, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to share with you what Yolo County has been doing to conduct our assessment appeal meetings. We have been conduct conducting remote assessment appeal hearings since March 25th of this year and have held four virtual hearings so far and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. Yolo County has one assessment appeals board and we receive about 200 applications per year. Currently, we have 286 outstanding appeals. When we needed to move to remote hearings, our board members were willing and able to transition into remote meetings fairly easily. At our last meeting in July, for the first time, the board heard a contested appeal as we planned ahead and came up with a plan on how to share and view exhibits at the appropriate time. 
All of our 45-day notices now include language that hearings will be held via Zoom. Regarding the extension provided by executive order, this has had no impact on our county as we have been able to schedule and obtain extensions and waivers as needed, and we have had no requests for interpreter services. Our business plan um, and challenges that we faced uh, presenting by the remote hearings are as follows. A key piece to us getting up to speed quickly in order to conduct remote hearings was that we had a key staff member familiar with Zoom who could schedule our meetings and provide basic training. What helped, too, was that we were somewhat familiar with Zoom as we had already started conducting Board of Supervisors meetings that way. The clerks had to learn how to moderate and clerk virtual meetings using Zoom, and we do, by the way, record the meetings. And there's two of us that clerk these meetings, and um, we work together as a team. Our board members and special county council were willing and able to transition fairly quickly to virtual meetings. With that being said, those that didn't have the proper equipment, such as speakers or cameras, purchased their own equipment as needed. Luckily, our AAB members and county council have been using electronic, pa um, electronic packets, so that was helpful. One of the other challenges was overcoming the perception that we wouldn't be able to conduct fair and transparent meetings virtually. Another challenge that we've run into, but we hope to have solution for, is accommodating taxpayers with special needs such as those who are computer challenged or don't have access to a computer or cell phone. I've heard this already um, expressed in earlier speakers, and that is true in Yolo County. Um, we're not a large county. We have a lot of rural areas, and so there are probably many who don't have access to Internet service. So we came up with a solution that we would provide them a space here in the county building, and we would provide assistance should they need to provide evidentiary hearing uh, or, uh, evidence as well as being able to address the board. Um, the um, other uh, challenge would be to allow evidentiary hearings, and um, especially for those that are large or complicated. Um, our county council was able to provide his expertise in these matters, and he guided us in determining how taxpayers and the assessor's office can present evidence and exhibits when ex admissibility is determined. And what we do is we send out an email at least um, by the Friday. We have our meetings on Wednesdays once a month except for June. And so on Fridays we would send out an email to the taxpayers explaining how we would be receiving their evidence should they need to present it. And we would ask that they send it to us by me email um, by the Monday by 5 p.m. so that we would have it ready to present to the board on the Wednesday hearing. And the assessor's office has also been given that same deadline so that we can be prepared. And then the last thing, um, one of the challenges was about figuring out how best for the chair to convey running the meeting in a virtual setting. We created a chair script that the clerk and chair read jointly to help guide members, staff, and taxpayers. These were created by our county council for our board of supervisors meetings, which we then customized to the assessment appeal meetings. They've had a huge difference in running the meeting smoothly from beginning to end. So um, one of the other challenges I wanted to just present was um, just in general, you know, how we can make these meetings be productive. And I feel like we have done a really good job in being able to carry on business as usual, even despite the fact that we are not having in-person meetings. Most of the um, items that come to the board are continued or postponed, um, but members uh, or taxpayers are willing to sign the extensions, and I don't believe they're mainly related because they can't appear in person. Usually about half of our appeals that are scheduled for hearings are usually continued anyway just because of timing. So um, I don't know if the COVID has impacted that at all, but we are just moving as for, uh, process as um we have been doing, and um, we plan to continue our remote hearings. And um, anyway, I think that's all I wanted to make comments on at this time. And if you have any questions or any other things you'd like to ask, I'm available. Thank you, Ms. Dockla. Is members, are there any questions? Hearing none, we'll move on. Uh, to our next speaker, we have the Honorable Shelley Scott, uh, Assessor, Recorder, County Clerk for Marin County. <clears throat> Is Shelley Scott available?
Uh, Chairman Vasquez, this is uh, Don Gakel, Stanislaus County Assessor, uh, President of the CAA. Yes. Um, I, I believe that Shelley Scott, um, because of the moving uh, and the timing away from yesterday, uh, has a conflict today and won't be able to participate. Um, I, I can share some of the uh, some of the things that she discussed with me, uh, if you would like. Uh, sure. You want to just give us a quick brief thing? Yeah, uh, the uh, you know Marin County um, has held some uh, virtual meetings for administrative purposes in uh, dealing with uh, stipulations, uh, withdrawals, and other administrative matters. Uh, as of right now, as far as I know, they have not actually held a, an evidentiary hearing, although they are preparing for that. Um, their uh, appraisers are. Uh, training on the uh, use of the uh, virtual technology and uh, and submission of documents in a, a virtual environment. Um, I, I know they are enthusiastic about uh, participating in the process. I, I did know she expressed uh, uh, concerns that have been expressed by many of the other counties uh, in that, again, the, the ability for all parties to uh, share documents uh, effectively and submit them effectively uh, so that uh, the hearing can proceed uh, as closely as possible to an in-person hearing. Um, she also expressed uh, concerns uh, that a number of other uh, assessors are concerned that um, that you know, perhaps uh, a lot of uh, homeowners, especially older homeowners, uh, may not have uh, access to uh, technology for remote hearings and uh, or may be challenged in the use of technology if they do have it. Uh, so there were uh, concerns going forward. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have um, a lot of the other information about how their board may be planning on, on going ahead. Uh, I do know that you know, being a mid-sized county, I suspect um, their appeal load is probably fairly consistent with uh, what Sonoma County expressed, what Yolo County expressed, and what we have in Stanislaus County as a mid-sized county, uh, in that we have about 300 and, uh, about 370 uh, open appeals uh, right now. So our, our mid-sized county appeal loads tend to be uh, quite a bit uh, smaller than um, the larger counties that uh, have presented. Uh, so uh, just as a side note, uh, Stanislaus County uh, is uh, proceeding ahead with um, in-person hearings using social distancing masks. But um, of course, as the assessor, I I'm prepared and very interested in the discussion uh, today um, in case uh, our clerk uh, switches uh, horses and decides to go in a virtual direction. So it it's been very um, enlightening to hear all of the speakers today. Um, I also wanted to note you have one speaker on rural uh, rural counties. I just want to let you, as, as the chair, know that uh, Plumas County Assessor Chuck Lennart is on the call today and uh, would be uh, willing to uh, present information from uh, a very rural county perspective uh, if you would like um, to have that information. So, uh, I, I would answer any questions that I, that I can answer if you have them. No, thank you. I appreciate it, uh, Mr. Gakel. Uh, what we'll do is let's run through it, and if time permits, we'll uh, we'll bring them up. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. With that, uh, members, uh, I want to move into our rural counties. Uh, our speaker representing the rural counties on business continuity is Ms. Melanie Curtis. Deputy Clerk, Board of Supervisors for Kings County. Is Ms. Curtis available? I am, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me today. My name is Melanie Curtis and I am the Deputy Clerk to the Kings County Board of Supervisors. I can tell you I find all of this very interesting because I am from a very rural county. Our rules are different in terms of um, we just don't have the numbers that everyone deals with, which is kind of nice. Um, but it also means we deal with, uh, we go without a lot of the bells and whistles that um, many other counties have available to them. For instance, we have 
two um, staff only complete total for the Board of Supervisors and Board of Equalization. Um, we operate with no agenda, solution software, and all of those kinds of things. So everything is very old school in our county. Um, that being said, um, we have far fewer applications to deal with, which is really fortunate because I'm not sure how we would cope with bigger numbers. Um, in all of 2018, we actually only had a total of 26 applications from 17 applicants. Um, and as of the 1st of June, we had 12 applications still um, in need of completion. Um, one of those applicants has a waiver and we're holding off on um, a hearing due to pending litigation and um, further audits. The remaining 11 were scheduled for late July and throughout August. As a result, we had one hearing, two applicants sign waivers and request postponement, five withdrawals, and three stipulations. Um, when the hearings were scheduled, we hoped that we would be back to normal or something closer to normal. So we just scheduled and uh, with the attitude of wait and see. And as the dates drew closer, we worked with County Council to establish protocol um, that would work, knowing that at least four of our board members would not want to do a strictly remote format. Um, and then the protocols needed to be sent to the applicants, which led to further withdrawals and stipulation agreements um, in the works. Um, for 2019, we actually only have 20 applications from 20 or from 15 applicants um, with waivers for three of these applicants. So our plan currently is to wait until after the beginning of 2021 to schedule any further hearings. If they do need to be scheduled under our current COVID situation, um, our plan is a is sort of a modified in-person hearing. What we have done is our board members are in chambers we, with the exception of one board member who has been participating in all meetings by WebEx because our board, just to clarify, our board of supervisors is our board of equalization. They sit for basically every board we have in the county. <laughs> The clerk and um, counsel for the board will be in chambers. The assessor's office has been keep asked to keep it to two representatives at a time in chambers um, with the possibility of rotating staff in and other staff can participate by WebEx. And the applicant has essentially been offered the same option. And we have asked that each side have at least one representative in chambers. And we've also asked for everyone to present um, their evidence prior to the hearing so they can be distributed because we have this uh, unique sort of hybrid situation uh, where I have one board member who is, is not physically present and the other four are. Um, so far, the one hearing that we have held had significant challenges in terms of though the applicant never uh, called or emailed or wrote about his concerns on the pro about the protocols, he did challenge them in the middle of the hearing, which left our counsel, who um, was in a BOE hearing for the very first time, um, left a little perplexed on how to handle that situation. Um, it was a little difficult, a little awkward. We worked our way through it. Um, so that so, and then the um, the evidence was not presented from. Um, from the applicant prior to the hearing, and in fact, he only brought one copy of all of his evidence and expected our board to pass it around. So um, it, it, we have different challenges in Kings County than other other states. Um, we are, it, it, things are just different. We don't have the same access to technology in many cases. Um, we just we just face different challenges, not not harder challenges, but different challenges. And um, the concerns that we have from Kings County are just the need for a little bit of um, guidance. And <coughs> we need to know essentially if what we're doing is acceptable and what kind of um, challenges that we might have in terms of due process going forward. Uh, we, we really were very concerned about the reaction from the one applicant for the hearing that we have held so far. Um, we don't have any specific plans moving forward that are different from what we've done, but we are planning on waiting until at least 2021 to schedule any further hearings. I don't really have anything else at this time, but I'm certainly open to any questions. Thank you. Uh, members, do we have any questions 
for Ms. Curtis. I do, if I could, just uh, yes, go ahead, Member Gaines. I, I think it's very interesting the uh, different responses uh, based on the diversity of our state, whether it's um, small, medium, or large. And part of my um, concern I have is that are we just uh, is this just a precursor to um, a mass of appeals uh, next year? Uh, people wanting uh, their property uh, revalued as a result of the pandemic. And then what is the consequence if Prop 15 passes? I mean, we've talked about that for months and months now, but um, imagine the impact of the pandemic uh, lowering property values potentially. I, I think that's, I think it's real. Uh, and couple that with the passage of Prop 15 and uh, I think we've got some huge challenges uh, in front of us, and um, but I'm I'm also heartened by the fact that the board is 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 looking at it. They're trying to be we're trying to be uh, out in front of it as best we can, uh, and that we're having this discussion uh, today, and that uh, we're in continual uh, discussion uh, with our county assessors, but. Um, just makes me wonder what uh, this may be just the beginning of the tsunami. I, I will be very honest and say that in Kings County, we are extremely concerned about the impact of the passage of Prop 15 should that pass. Unlike larger counties, we really have no benefit to that to that proposition because we won't see a huge increase in roll value. Um, our our property values just aren't that high in this county. We're small, we're rural, there's not a lot of up and down, um, and, and so we're very concerned. And our assessor is planning for absolutely a tsunami of applications. And to be bluntly honest, Kings County has no way currently to deal with those, and particularly if we are doing remote hearings because they have been very challenging for us. I'm just not certain what our plan will be um, moving forward. And, and right now, unlike other counties, we don't even hold administrative type hearings. All hearings that we hold are evidentiary hearings and, and beyond that they just have meetings to accept withdrawals and stipulations. But our, our board currently does it all. And so not only will this impact us in terms of numbers, but it, it will completely change the way we do business um, as a board of supervisors and board of equalization. Yeah, thank you for your comments. Mr. Chair, this is Malia. Uh, may I speak? Yes, go ahead, Member Cohen. Thank you. Um, several thoughts I have here. Uh, first, um, I guess to all the presenters, one thing I'm hearing consistently is that it's not a one size fits all, right? What's hap what, what, what would benefit LA County or the Silicon Valley or the Bay Area counties clearly won't benefit or help. Kings County and some of the rural counties. So I'm in no interest, I have no interest in implementing or creating any kind of a policy or encouraging the governor to put an executive order out there that will wound any of our counties. So it sounds like we need to have uh, a very precise or use precision in our, in our approach, a scalpel as opposed to a sledgehammer and helping to address these prop these questions to all, um, to, so Mr. Gaines, you've asked a series of questions I think that are very pertinent. And um, I, we had an informational in San Jose and I think that that was the one that you were unable to attend. I think you were traveling with your daughter at that time. This was last year. And um, your questions are actually spot on. Um, we heard extensively in the uh, hearing last year about the backlog of assessment appeals and we explored ways in which to use best practices or even to explore alternatives that have, haven't been considered in, in addressing the backlog. And at the time, we also talked about the role, split role. At that time, the initiative hadn't qualified for the ballot. So we're in a different place today in 2020. But it appears that remote hearings was not an option on the table at that time last year when we were initiating the conversation. And it may present a viable alternative if we're able to address um, 
um, the identified challenges while simultaneously protecting the taxpayer's due process. And first and foremost, keeping everyone's health and safety as our number one priority. I think that goes without saying, right? We all, we're all on the same page on that once, whether we're talking about staff, whether we're talking about taxpayers, and everyone involved in, the, in this entire process. It's about safety first, but also these, these conversations are helpful um, because although we scratched the surface last year, this year it's even more relevant, right? What technologies are available? So now uh, we're hearing from the uh, Kings County representative um, and we're in the pandemic. Uh, I, I'm wondering if, um, if you have any top three issues that you 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 want us to assist you in in, in helping to solve um in, in in i think i think if i heard correctly you said you do have a few cases of, a few backlog cases is that right this is for kings county um i would say at this point i wouldn't exactly say we have any backlog because okay. we currently now have no um, applicants that are about to, you know, the the, the term of, is about to expire. Um, we have obtained waivers for anyone who was close. Okay. So at this point, as far as our backlog, we really are okay. But if this it goes on for any great length of time, then we will have issues that we need to address. So I would say the I, the issues I identified as being important is to um, have some clarity on the acceptability of, of remote hearings and particularly this hybrid type hearing that our board has somewhat insisted on, um, insisted on doing. Um, it's been pretty challenging and, and, I, and I question how valid these hearings are at this point. Um, I would also say to have to shoot for extensions that are long enough for counties to either adequately reschedule hearings that do need to take place or to um, at least to develop uh, workable hearing formats for small counties like ours where the technology just, it, it's very challenging. Very few people in our county have internet speeds that are high enough to really support something like WebEx well. It's been a, a huge challenge for us, even mm -hmm. with our Board of Supervisors meetings. Mm -hmm. And then to provide some guidelines and trainings for conducting remote hearings without affecting due process because the, the exchange of information and evidence was very challenging in the one hearing that we've conducted so far. And, and that was considering we only had one board member not present for the, for the hearing. So um, I'm, I'm really hoping to have some additional information tools available. Um, but also I'm, I would say I'm very concerned with that whole idea of the the one size fits all and I, I really implore the the board to to just take in into consideration that what what works for LA and San Francisco definitely will not work for us because we just don't have access to the same tools and neither do our constituents. We hear you. We will we definitely will take that to heart. I understand completely. Um, I'm wondering in your county do you have a lot of seniors? We do have um, a, a fairly significant senior population. Mm -hmm. We don't have many seniors who, we, we have very few homeowner mm -hmm. appeals anyway. For all of 2018 and 2000, 2019, we had a total of four homeowner appeals, um, two of which were from the same homeowner and they've had a long standing um, dispute with the board. Um, they are all seniors though. And um, so that, that was a challenge and, and I was, we were all willing if he was um, unwilling um, or unable to come in person to a hearing to try to find a way to work with him. And of course we gave, we gave him the option of um, postponing until um, later in the year um, or signing a waiver and, and just putting it out until this is over. Um, so, so it, it, we, we, we just aren't affected a lot by our senior population. Okay. No, I'm just trying to understand a little bit more about the demographics. Kings County, I um, haven't had the pleasure to spend a lot of time in. So you, you calling in and sharing, sharing your experiences and perspective is very informative. Um, so I'll pose we're, a question to you. We're very small. <laughs> well, let me pose a question to you and to like all of the presenters that we've already heard and those that we are going to hear from. I'm interested in knowing um, more on how you're working with unrepresented taxpayers. 
And to Kings County, you may or may not even have, oh, that may not even be an issue, but I would imagine like in LA and San Francisco County, maybe in some of the medium sized counties that there may be a little bit more issues and un, um, unrepresented taxpayers. In the five and a half years I've been working in Kings County, we've only had one unrepresented taxpayer come into hearing and um, he has represented himself quite well. Um, it, it really hasn't been a problem, so I, I can't speak to that very well. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have no other questions. Thank you. Let's go on. Uh, thank you, Ms. Curtis, as well. Let's go on with, we have two speakers now on the challenges and opportunities of the business continuity for taxpayers. We'll start with uh, Mr. Paul Waldman, CMI President, California Alliance of Taxpayer Advocates. Is Mr. Waldman available? Yes, I'm on. Welcome. And, uh, thank you. Um, so, morning. yes, I'm Paul Waldman of CADA. First, Chairman Vasquez and members of the board, can for holding this important hearing yesterday and today. Uh, we believe that need to be thoroughly explored to be sure that taxpayers' rights and due process. Uh, Chair Vasquez, he appears to be breaking up. I'm having trouble yeah. hearing. Mr. Waldman, I don't know if you're able to uh, adjust your connection because you're kind of breaking up. I apologize. Is that better? It sounds a little better. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll try it again. Uh, so, uh, as I said, first I, I wanted to. You know, Mr. Waldman, um, you might have. Do you have a. Do you also. Are you also live streaming this event when you're, you're, you're hearing on two different things? It, it interrupts. No, I'm, I'm not live streaming, but I am hearing an echo. Um, Somebody yeah. needs to mute then. Uh, yeah, I wonder if, that, if someone's not muted. Members, are we all muted? Let's try it again. Okay. All right, I'll try it again. Um, so again, I just wanted to uh, uh, thank you for holding this uh, this hearing yesterday and today. Uh, uh, this really is important uh, that uh, taxpayers' rights don't get um, short-circuited uh, in the remote hearing process. Um, I just have a, a really just a few points that I want to emphasize in this session. I'm going to leave further detail on the next session, so I'll be fairly brief. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, with regard to business continuity and the backlog of hearings that have been postponed, uh, I want to start with an issue that we brought up several times and it applies here as well. Uh, it will be important to consider sort of what order hearings are being heard and, and, how, they're, and how they're being scheduled uh, in consideration of the two-year statute and how the use of waivers is applied under uh, Revenue Taxation Code 1604C. Uh, we have been a little bit concerned about how that will happen if, uh, you know, as the boards are running up against the two-year deadline, the ones that are under waivers kind of get pushed sort of to the back. And uh, we, we do want to see that be addressed at some point. Uh, with regard to business continuity, um, and um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the complexity of creating a remote hearing process that will almost certainly involve uh, extensive clerk participation with regard to process, document exchange, et cetera, um, this may cause business continuity issues from that perspective as well. If the clerks are sort of overwhelmed with that process, we may have other issues with regard to scheduling and, and, and other items. Uh, one challenge we anticipate with regard to remote hearings is the 10-day notice requirement. Many of these hearings will have already been postponed previously, leaving only a 10-day notice needed for the rescheduled hearing. There are three concerns that we see with this. Uh, the time needed to gather material and witnesses uh, while we're still under various levels of quarantine. Uh, also, uh, will both the board and the taxpayer have time to decide whether a remote hearing will be feasible or an in-person hearing will be needed? And third, if a remote hearing is determined, uh, will there be time to coordinate all the materials uh, with the clerk and the board? Um, and uh, Member Cohen, you did mention that um, there is not necessarily a one-size-fits-all uh, solution here on the one hand, but I, I, I do I do wonder if there will be an issue with uh, really very different processes in each county. Um, we, we were concerned about having maybe a uniform standard for certain things. Um, uh, um, and 
that said, with regard to, for example, whether there's whether there are hearings telephonically or via video, uh, if video, what will the quality standards be? This will be discussed further by uh, our Chair Emeritus Peter Kostyanov in item C in the next section. Um, as noted earlier today, the clerks and boards will be using a lot of new technology, which suggests a learning curve that can potentially create due process issues, as I think was alluded to a little bit as well uh, earlier today. Um, in addition, taxpayers will need to be familiar with and get familiar with the technology to effectively present their case, as was noted by Sonoma County earlier. Uh, with regard to telephonic versus video, I had a conversation yesterday with my colleagues in other states and have experienced uh, uh, several of both. Uh, one, uh, one in Colorado and one in Florida. Uh, the video hearing um, uh, was in, um, in Colorado, I believe. And they had a very, very simple value case. And they actually did have a, 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 a hearing case. And they said it went fairly well. Uh, they didn't feel they were able to do everything they would have as they did as they would have in an in-person hearing. Uh, but it, it wasn't a, a complete fail. Um, the telephonic hearing, on the other uh, hand, uh, that my colleague mentioned in Florida, did go very poorly. Uh, without the visual communication, it was very difficult to present a case, to cross-examine, et cetera. There was just too much to loss to make any kind of an effective case without video. Uh, so that's just a, a couple of anecdotal uh, issues with regard to telephonic and video hearings. Um, we also feel a uniform standard will be needed as to when remote hearings can be done. Uh, similar to uh, what some of the speakers said yesterday, we believe remote hearings can be done for administrative hearings, such as pre-hearing conferences, uh, acceptable uh, value recommendations, uh, possibly validity hearings, depending on the complexity. Uh, I also want to reemphasize what my colleague, uh, Cana Board Chair Chris O'Neill, said yesterday. Uh, it's important to remember that these assessment appeals boards are essentially a quasi-judicial agency. For hearing, uh, you can't get a do-over in court. Uh, some information communication will be lost in the process of the remote hearing. So it's critically important that accepting a lesser result not be taken in order for expediency to have these hearings. Uh, this is why, uh, again, this hearing that you're having uh, yesterday and today is so important and appreciated. Uh, again, I wanted to uh, focus our comments today on the uh, elements we feel are necessary in order to make remote hearings work. Uh, if remote hearings will be considered for value hearings, particularly of any complexity, uh, discussion on what we think will be needed in order to have these remote hearings will be discussed by uh, uh, Peter Kostyanov in, in item uh, C. Uh, as I said, my comments were brief. Uh, I just wanted to, I'm going to defer the rest of my uh, presentation to Pete and item C. Uh, again, I want to thank you for your time, and that concludes my comments. Thank you. Members, if there's no questions, we'll move on to uh, our next speaker, Mr. Scott Kaufman with Harvard Harvest Taxpayer Association. Is Mr. Kaufman available? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Hello, as mentioned, I'm Scott Kaufman, Legislative Director at the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. Uh, I guess I'd just start by thanking you, the Chairman and the Board, for inviting us to speak, and we appreciate the Board taking the time to hear from all parties about how to make this process as equitable as possible. Uh, I'll try to keep my, res my remarks short out of respect for your time and the Governor's order to close early and for the fact that a lot of our concerns have already been stated by multiple folks before. Uh, I guess ultimately we don't see any way around the need for at least the option of remote hearing and the appeals board simply having to hurry through their workload to, to meet the two-year statutory requirements. They'll have to be careful that as they hurry that they don't skip any due process. That seems the most likely pitfall caused by COVID-19. Care must be taken about scheduling, providing both sides ample time to repair and keeping taxpayers informed. And the assessors might have to accept some defeats by default because of the passage of time. Uh, for taxpayers, the two biggest issues we see is the need for clear and specific instructions and multiple options for participation. The notice regarding how to appear must be crystal clear and there should be confirmation that the notice is received. Otherwise, people could reasonably argue later that they never knew how to show up or were denied due process. Uh, we feel video communication is a must and obviously not all taxpayers have the same access to and understanding of technology. There must be some provision of internet access for those who don't have it. With libraries closed, perhaps regional offices or other government facilities with video capabilities can still be made available to taxpayers as needed. But for, the, for most people, Zoom will work or any Zoom-like uh, video 
software and court hearings have been taking place that way for months now and so we think that they might be a, a good representation of how to handle uh these quasi-judicial proceedings in, uh, in the time of COVID. Uh, also, access documentation documentation is also a concern, but that's been mentioned by most of the speakers on this call. So I'll stop there. And, and again, thank you for your time and answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Members, are there any questions uh, of Mr. Coffin? Hearing none, uh, thank you, Mr. Coffin, for your valuable insight. And that pretty much wraps up uh, the this B item. Let me ask uh, Ms. Davis if there's any public comment on this before we take a break. AT&T moderator, can you please check to see if there's anyone on the line who'd like to make a public com comment regarding this matter? Yes, ma'am, I'll be glad to. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to provide a public comment, you may press one and then zero on your touchtone keypad. And once again, if you'd like to provide a public comment, you may press one then zero at this time. And I have no one in queue to provide public comment. Mr. Chairman, we do have several public comments that have been submitted for um, that need to be read into the minutes. You want to do that now? Hi, Ms. Davis. This is um, Acting Board Proceedings Chief Henry Nanjo. I believe the comments I have are all for M1C. Um, I don't believe I have any for M1B. Okay. Thank you. For Thank you. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any public comments for this matter. Um, are you ready to take a break at this time? I was thinking, let's go ahead and take a break. I'm assuming staff probably needs a break as well. Yes, that sounds great. Let's go ahead and take a break. And then what, what's uh, adequate for the staff? Do we need 20 or 25 minutes? What's your preference? I'll defer to our um, executive director, Ms. Fleming. Are you available? Thank you, Ms. Davis. Uh, chairman and members, if we could take a 25-minute break, that would be helpful. All right, we'll do a 25-minute break. So it's 11, well, 1146, 11, 11 we'll say 1215. That would work, thank you, sir. 30 minutes, 29-minute break. So. All right, we'll give them an extra four minutes here. Thank you, we'll take a break. We'll see you at 1215. First of all, I'd just like to thank all the participating members uh, for that first panel and the discussion today. It went great. Now we'll move into uh, the second part of this, which was the C item here and <clears throat> M1C item, which is the County Boards of Equalization Assessment Appeals Boards. And it's my understanding, I think we might be changing the order. Is that correct, staff? That is correct, sir. We'll take our BOE speaker last. All right. So, Ms. Davis, if you can go ahead and uh, call the item, and then we'll get going. Our next item is M1C, County Boards of Equalization Assessment Appeals Board Remote Hearings for Discussion and Possible Action. Uh, we will have our BOE speaker go last. Go ahead, Chairman Vasquez. So, we'll start off with then. Uh, if I have this right, with the Mr. Thomas Parker, Deputy County Counsel for the Los Angeles. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is Thomas Parker with Los Angeles County Council. Uh, on behalf of Los Angeles County, 
I want to express our appreciation to the state board, its its governing board, and its staff for taking the time and making all of this effort to discuss these important topics. Um, I would first like to um, make some brief comments, if I could, and then I understand that Member Cohen posed several questions yesterday, and uh, and I hope. I'm going to, if the board will allow me to, offer some comments on those questions, as well as the question that came up at the tail end of this morning, which had to do with the uh, discussion of one size fits all versus reflecting the different realities of different size counties. And I, and, um, and I hope to very briefly cover that. Sure, First good. off, the Los Angeles, thank you, sir. The Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors is very interested in exploring the implementation of virtual assessment appeals board hearings using video conferencing technology and has directed county staff to report back to the board on how to do so. That will be as of now, August 25th of this year. Some issues that we have identified to date are ensuring that AABs may utilize virtual hearings not only during the emergency, during pursuant to the authority of the governor's executive orders, but also as a long-term solution to our backlog of cases. Ensuring that virtual hearings are treated as the legal equivalent of in-person hearings such that due process is satisfied and that the applicant's agent's participation would be mandatory when they are held. Ensuring the availability of virtual hearing technology so that all parties may fully participate in the hearings. Establishing protocols for advanced submission of documents and exhibits from both parties, as well as distribution of them at at whatever point in time is chosen. Developing secure and reliable virtual hearing technology and document management systems. Protecting confidential information of taxpayers that is raised during the virtual hearing. Ensuring access to hearings by the general public. Guidance and direction from the State Board of Equalization on how to best move forward with implementation of virtual hearings would be extremely helpful. Regarding the questions raised by board members yesterday and today, the unrepresented taxpayers, the, uh, the, the question of uh, of whether one size fits all or whether different protocols and guidance might apply to different counties, the Kings counties of the world versus the Los Angeles and San Diego's of the world. That is an important issue and I'm glad it got raised. From a purely personal viewpoint, I've worked now for five counties as a property tax lawyer. As small as Calusa County, with all of 22,000 people, as well as El Dorado with about 170,000 people, all the, way to, all the way up to my current employer, Los Angeles, with 10 million plus. So as a property tax lawyer, in my own experience, I have seen small, medium, and large counties handle property tax matters and AAB appeals. That is an important issue for the state board to resolve as a part of its process. Regarding the question of the three most important issues that the state board should work on, the first would be review the review and necessary modifications or LTAs regarding hearing procedures as needed. This gets to this first point I talked about, the question of one size fits all versus different rules. But however the state board chooses to address that question and that issue, we do need state board guidance. 
what part of due process is identified and needed as necessary for remote hearings. A, a number of good elements and valid elements of due process have already been mentioned by other speakers, so I will not repeat them here. And thirdly, and this is very important, ensure legal authority beyond the governor's executive orders N63-20 and N72-20 for the holding of remote hearings after this emergency has officially ended. To the question, what is the greatest challenge to due process in remote hearings? The greatest challenge, but certainly not the only challenge, is ensuring that ensuring technology is used that will allow access for the parties to carry out their participatory functions and for the public to observe if they wish to. Steps that the county is taking to address the remote hearing challenges have already been addressed by speakers earlier today. I would not try to repeat them or state them any better. The, the question was, was raised yesterday by member Cohen at, towards the end of the day. Is there statutory authority right now for remote hearings? And speaking as a legal counsel, it's my view that there is no explicit statutory authority right now and there's no explicit regulatory authority for remote hearings. Um, so the state board needs to provide some regulatory authority for remote hearings, and it's an open, and, it, and it's a potential question as to whether or not statutory legislative authority should be also obtained, if possible, from the state legislature. Um, with that, I will answer any questions the board may have. Thank you. Members, do we have any questions? Hearing and seeing none. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Melinda. Oh, Good afternoon, yes. everyone. Welcome back. Uh, just to the speaker, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to thank him for listening and, and speaking to the questions that I raised uh, yesterday. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we will move on. Uh, <clears throat> second speaker we have on this topic is actually we're inviting back. Uh, this, we have uh, Marvis Masick, Chief Deputy City Clerk for San Diego County Board of Supervisors. Is Ms. Uh, Masick available? I'm here, are you able to hear me? Yes, welcome back. Thank you, thank you again, Mr. Chairman and members of the board um, for the opportunity to provide comments on this matter. Um, actually, a majority of our concerns have already been addressed by Mr. Parker, so as not to repeat the challenges that he's already mentioned um, and the suggestions that have been made, um, I'll simply reiterate that consistent statewide guidelines, um, particularly for um, virtual hearings with regard to the timeline and protocols for submission of exhibits would be extremely helpful for us. Um, the other challenges that we have faced have been more um, along the lines of translating some of our physical in-person processes to the virtual processes that we're currently doing. So there are more business process things that we have been able to handle. Um, so again, statewide guidelines would provide us with consistency um, across um, the, the region as a whole in the virtual process. Um, subject to any questions, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for being brief. With that, uh, let's bring, let's see if uh, Lisa Cho, Deputy County Counsel for San Mateo County, is she available? Yes, I'm here. Welcome. Hello, thank you, uh, Chairman Vasquez and members of the board. My name is Lisa Cho and I'm with the San Mateo County Council's office. And Can you speak up just a little bit louder? Sure, is this better? Thank you. Okay, 
I am counsel to the AAB here in San Mateo County. We're located in the Bay Area and we encompass the west side of the Bay from South San Francisco all the way to Menlo Park and we serve a population of 760,000. Um, we are one of the counties that has not yet reopened for hearing, whether in person or online. And I was asked to share my perspectives on um, the challenges that we face with moving to online hearings. Um, since the shelter in place went into effect in March of this year, our AAB has canceled its hearings two months at a time as we assess the pandemic situation and the possibility of reopening for hearings safely. Um, one important factor to note is that we actually convene at the San Mateo County Superior Court in the County Board of Supervisors Chamber, which is located on the first floor of the courthouse. Um, this is a heavily trafficked public building. And until recently, due to a bunch of construction projects that were going on around the courthouse, all staff and members of the public were going through one main entrance, which also um, serves as a security checkpoint. So there was some concern over safety and social distancing. And um, the court itself has tried to limit its in-person proceedings to only those departments where such proceedings are truly required. And in many cases, they have been able to move their less complex hearings online, although it's my understanding that they have not done so yet for a full evidentiary trial. So due to the physical aspect of where our hearings are conducted, uh, there has been a real concern about health exposure risks to our board, our staff, as well as the party that would come with convening in-person hearings at this time. Our AAB members have expressed a desire to move to remote hearings if possible. Um, on the technology side of things, we are fortunate that our county's ISD department has not only assisted our board of supervisors in moving to hearings online, but they have also assisted several of our court departments in doing so as well. So through that process, they've been able to do a lot of the troubleshooting and work out some of the technological challenges um, of conducting hearings online that have been shared by other um, speakers throughout these proceedings. Um, our ISD staff has indicated that if and when we are prepared to go to remote hearings, they will help with setting up a Zoom webinar account, which is a platform that would allow the commissioners and the parties to participate in the hearing, as well as allow for members of the public to view a live stream at the same time, and that would preserve the public's right of access. Um, ISD states that they will also assist with providing training to our AAB members and clerks. They can run us through a practice hearing where we can all get familiar with the features of the platform, as well as helping to create a protocol for our parties to log in online, similar to the protocols that they've created for the court. So from a technological standpoint, I do feel that we would be well um, supported by ISD. We've also had some discussions about um, the sharing of documents in a manner where we don't have to be passing uh, physical documents to one another. And so they have suggested the use of a secure online Dropbox. And so I was very interested to hear what others have had to share about the benefits and challenges of using such document sharing platforms. And I'm very open and wanting to collaborate further with other counties regarding whether one particular platform is preferable to another. Um, as far as numbers, we are fortunately in a position where our taxpayer applicants have uh, more or less been amenable to waiving the two-year statute of limitations due to the ongoing pandemic. We had one appeal that had a pending deadline in November of this year, but with Governor Newsom's recent executive order, that deadline has now been pushed out to the end of January, um, which provides us with relief. And I wanted to express my sincere thanks to the board and the board staff, as well as to the governor's office for hearing and responding to that need on the part of our AABs across the state. Um, for us, the next earliest two-year deadline doesn't come up until July of 2021, but we are very cognizant that hearings cannot be held off indefinitely and that there will be a major backlog of appeals once we do reconvene. We've had approximately 30 new appeals get filed since the shelter in place went into effect, and we have had to reschedule nearly 700 appeals during this shutdown. Um, as far as comparing numbers from last year to this year, in 2019, we had uh, 1,502 open appeals. In 2020, we had 1,345 open appeals. So there's a slight decline in the number of, of appeals that have been filed. Um, the main concern and the number one ask that we would have for the Board of Equalization is the need for state level guidance and protocols for conducting remote hearings in a manner where due process concerns are addressed. And this has been spoken to by many of my other co-speakers on the panel. 
Um, I have been keeping up to date with reports from my federal county council offices across the state and have noted the challenges that other counties have faced as they have already moved towards conducting evidentiary hearings online. And the primary challenges, of course, are determining whether a witness is being coached off screen and the ability for parties and the panel to adequately view one another's demeanor and facial expressions throughout the hearing when they're also trying to navigate through electronic documents, whether on the same screen or on a, se on a separate screen. Um, the second ask that we would have is guidance on how to timely and securely share documents prior to a hearing and any protocols for when parties wish to introduce additional documents at hearing, which often occurs when we are in an in-person setting. Uh, certainly throughout uh, today and yesterday's proceedings, there have been a lot of other uh, very helpful insights that have been shared. Um, I want to note that the courts have been able to move towards some remote hearings with guidance and orders from the Chief Justice, as well as the Judicial Council. And so on behalf of our AEP, we would seek similar guidance and protocols from the state on how to proceed with remote hearings during this unprecedented time. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my country's perspective with you today. Thank you. Members, do we have any questions for Ms. Cho? Hearing none, we will go ahead and move on to our next speaker, which is Marcy L. Berkman, Deputy Council, uh, County Council for Santa Clara County. Is Ms. Berkman available? I am. Thank you very much for taking leadership on this issue and convening this meeting. With the permission of the board, I'll briefly provide information responding to some of the questions the board asked this morning, uh, then provide some brief input from the Assessment Appeals Board members and hearing officers in Santa Clara County, and finally address a few thoughts regarding the challenges attendant to remote hearing. In Santa Clara County, our hearings primarily go forward in English, English, though we do provide translators for those who need them. They can either request it in advance or come with their own translators. Uh, mostly those languages are Vietnamese, Cantonese, Mandarin, and then a smattering once in a while of Spanish or European languages. Um, over 4,000 appeals thus far have not been heard uh, due to the pandemic uh, in the time since mid-March that were originally scheduled for hearing dates. Santa Clara County greatly appreciates this board's leadership and work in obtaining the necessary executive order, extending and tolling the two-year statute. In Santa Clara County, our cases would have started running statute without that order right about now. Thanks to that order, none of our cases will run statute until at least January 31st, 2021. Without this, 35 cases would have run statute in August and September alone. And from the data we put together back when the task force was first meeting, Without the executive order, 181 cases would have run statute by the end of this year, placing $2.98 billion at risk. Um, this week, Santa Clara County recommenced yesterday socially distanced hearings. What our Assessment Appeals Board clerk is doing is doubling up on the number of hearings that each Assessment Appeals Board and each hearing officer holds each month. Normally, each of our three boards and Several hearing officers meet once per month uh, at regularly scheduled hearings in addition to any specially set for large cases. And so what they are doing is each board will hold their originally regularly scheduled hearing date for the rest of the year. And then each month, each board and hearing officer will additionally hold a second date to cover a hearing date that they weren't able to do in March, April, May, June, and July. Uh, and that way we will work our way expeditiously through all the cases that were not heard. Um, they have worked with our public health department uh, to set up a large hearing room with appropriate social distancing measures and appropriate protection to hopefully keep everybody safe. Um, and so at the moment, what they are hoping and planning on doing um, is doing live socially distanced hearings with personal protective equipment and plexiglass shields uh, and everyone masked and all of that. Uh, so that's how they're currently planning to proceed. Um, just in terms of volume, our hearing officers here are scheduled for approximately 55 cases a day. Usually maybe 10 to 20 of those end up going live and the remaining are stipulated or continued uh, if someone needs a continuance. Our three member AAB panels will hear up to 400 appeal manners a day, more usually 100 to 200. 
Uh, most of our homeowners and small businesses are unrepresented. The large tech companies, commercial industrial properties, data centers, and a few individuals uh, tend to be represented by agents. I pulled my assessment appeal mem board members, and we are blessed in Santa Clara County to have very highly educated MAIs and very experienced assessment appeals board members. One of them would really like remote hearings. The remaining hearing officers and appeals board members feel that they can only properly perform their duties live uh, and with paper, and none of them are comfortable with being able to adequately perform their duties uh, remotely. Um, so even if it means being in the room masked and with social distancing protocols, for most of them, that is their preference. One of our hearing officers noted um, that being in the room isn't only a judicial proceeding for a lot of taxpayers who are self-represented and even some of those who have agents. It's a once in a lifetime experience that also has an emotional component in resolving their judicial issue about their tax value. And for many of them appearing remotely would not have the same impact in terms of how they respond to the process and how much justice they feel they have received as would being in the room with them. Um, I also spoke with the hearing officers and assessment appeals members about how they would feel about reviewing stipulations remotely, um, since we usually do that without the applicants and assessors in the room. And then if they have no questions, they waive the appearance of the parties and only call them back on a later date if they need further information. And with the exception of one of our board members, all of them felt that they would rather come in with personal protective equipment and social distancing and review the stipulations in person on paper. Um, as far as the challenges for remote hearings, as others have mentioned, most importantly, to ensure that we have the appropriate statutory and or regulatory authority for moving forward with remote hearings. Uh, and then after that, of ensuring that there are appropriate procedures and protocols governing getting documents to the clerk and the scheduling of that. Since at the moment, there's no requirement to exchange documents in advance and uh, many issues that come up with that. So those sorts of issues around the procedures for remote hearings are also important. Um, there are, as many of my board members have mentioned, uh, inherent difficulties in trying to simultaneously watch the parties on the screen and assess their credibility, while at the same time trying to deal with documentation on the screen and the evidence on the screen. And the more complex the case, the more difficult this is. Uh, from my own experience, I found it nearly impossible uh, to work with multiple windows on a small laptop alone, much less with uh, Zoom people and looking at doc documents. Uh, and so it, I think it would even be challenging if people had two large screens like I have in my setup in the office. Uh, but especially for most people, individuals and assessment appeals board members, dealing with both documents and people on the screen at the same time would be very difficult. And my board members at least feel like it would make them less able to do their job well. Um, as others have mentioned, especially in Santa Clara County, it's fairly common for taxpayers and the assessor alike to provide rebuttal documents and updated exhibits. And often they create these on the fly during the hearings in response to some flaw in their analysis that an appeals board member will have pointed out and they'll generate a revised document printed out and you know hand in copies to the clerk so that's not uncommon and how would that happen during remote hearings is another question that would need to be addressed my board members have also noted that it can be difficult to assess facial movements and take cues from eye contact via zoom uh, both in terms of difficulties for the taxpayers in being able to assess how well their arguments are landing with the assessment appeals board and take a different tack in explaining their thinking and analysis um, if they don't seem to be making their point well. And that's very hard to judge if you can't make eye contact, as well as being able to judge from the board when the board needs them to change topic or start stop talking. And the board similarly expressed that they have those kind of issues in assessing response from both parties before them. And then a final problem is the inherent internet delays and freezes. Uh, it's frequent for internet connections to be unstable and drop or to freeze. And there's always some time delay before a drop person would be able to call the clerk 
in which other people may or may not be aware that the person has frozen and unsure what they have and have not heard. Uh, from my personal experience, uh, I live at the top of the hill where the fiber optics don't come all the way up. And I can only hold a video call reliably if I am on auto, audio only. If I turn on a video connection, it becomes unstable. And, you know, I suspect that others around the county have similar problems. Uh, so I thank the board very, very much for the time and leadership on this. And it is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Members, do we have any questions? I do, uh, Chair Vasquez. Go ahead, Member Gaines. Yeah, I want to thank uh, Marcy Berkman for her comments. And I'm just um, trying to get a sense of maybe on the less complicated cases, uh, do you think those can be handled uh, remotely or virtually versus the more complicated, um, say, commercial property cases? Our least complicated cases go before our value hearing officers, and those are single family residential properties, um, almost all of which are rep self represented taxpayers. Both my hearing officers felt that they could not do their job appropriately working via virtual remote hearings, and both of them expect a, expressed a strong preference to having live socially distanced hearings, even with having to wear okay. masks at them. Okay. So that's that is the preferred uh, protocol for Santa Clara County for all cases? Yes, at the moment we, at, at the moment we are proceeding. Uh, we just started yesterday and they've put together essentially a double schedule of cases. All the cases that would normally be being, being heard through, I think they've planned out at least through November at this point, plus additional hearing days to cover the hearing days that did not happen in March through June. So each board is hearing, you know, its current calendar plus a calendar that it missed in March. Okay. And yeah. way forward. Yeah, and you think that you can, um, you're okay in terms of backlog and be able to, to handle that and stay on schedule? Um, I know that the executive order has been of great assistance to us and things not running this year. Yeah. Um, I anticipate that it might be something that would be greatly desired and necessary to get additional extension legislatively or through the governor as time moves on. Um, we have so far missed 4,000 hearings. Um, and so that's wow. created a backlog and we are doing everything we can to go through that. But as these happen, it of course creates additional backlogs further down the road. So we'll know as time passes how that's looking, but we're doing our best and further assistance would be greatly appreciated as well. Okay. Very well. Thank you. Mr. Chair, this is Malia. May I have a, may I ask Ms. Berkman a question? Go ahead, Member Thank Khan. you. Ms. Berkman, uh, curious, if a taxpayer wants a remote hearing, will they be able to have one? Especially when you consider that the, ex with the executive order in place. Um, and I, I have to believe that there's some taxpayers that don't want to come in, especially uh, with these shelter in place orders in place um, and virus load increasing in your county, do taxpayers have that flexibility? At the moment, we are not set up for remote hearings, and I don't believe my county has begun addressing how to do that. And uh, I think it will be tremendously helpful from the guidance from the board as they begin to put together statewide protocols for that. Um, but at the moment, we have not begun working towards remote hearings because our county chose instead to do live socially distanced hearings. I have a question. Who makes the decision in your county? Is it the county board of supervisor? Is it the health executive officer? Who, who determines? Our, our, our health I believe it was our health executive officer in conjunction with our county executive um, and other high-level people at the county. Um, and I'd have to look to see exactly who that memo came from, but they released a memo, oh gosh, maybe a month, a month and a half ago, uh, permitting those bodies that conduct uh, judicial and quasi-judicial hearings, evidentiary hearings of the county, to begin going forward again with in-person hearings according to the social distance, pro the, the public health protocols established by the public health officer. So I know, for example, that facilities and fleet working uh, using the formulas provided by the public health officer and 
the instructions from the public health officer, came in and measured out and spaced out the room and calculated the maximum number of people permitted in the room at once and uh, worked to put up plexiglass shields and the other spacing and ensure all the productions required by our public health officer would be there. Uh, and so I, I believe the decision was made by county exec together with the public health officer and other high level people at the county. Okay. You mentioned that you I don't polled... recall exactly who the memo came from. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that you polled the AAB members and they said they yeah. prefer to be in person. Is that right? Correct. Except for one of our members. Okay. Um, and we have one member who, who um, had medically a rough time for a while um, okay. and he would uh, he would very much prefer remote hearings. So how many AAB members are there? We have three three member panels. We have four hearing officers. Okay. Um, so but what about the taxpayers' you know, concerns? Wait, hold on. So I know you polled AAB, but what about your taxpayers the, who, were, who were all serving? What, how, are, how is their voice Sounds like their voice is missing in this decision making process. And I don't want to make the assumption that it's missing. I just I'm asking you, was there consider my consideration taken for them? My my understanding from the clerk of the board um, is that there have been some tax pickers who have been inquiring whether there are remote hearings mm -hmm. um, that uh, taxpayers who wish to do so have been signing waivers and, you know, asking their hearings to be continued um, okay. and that some taxpayers would prefer to come in. In fact, we had two taxpayers who very much were insistent on coming in for our first hearing yesterday mm -hmm. and were very clear that they did not want their cases to continue to be continued, and are but these, they wanted to come in and present them. Are these taxpayers, are they lawyers representing a client? I know you've got some pretty big. No, these are uh, these are taxpayers representing themselves. Both of them were individual homeowners. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, for our value okay. hearing, for our value hearing officers, almost all of the applicants are self-represented, and for our assessment appeals board, the vast majority of homeowners are self-represented, as well as small businesses. Um, and we tend to have the occasional representation of a homeowner by an agent, the occasional representation of a small business by an agent, and mostly where we see agents and lawyers are the big tech companies like Apple and Google and data okay. centers. We have data centers that are represented by agents. Okay. All right. I, I appreciate that clarification. So just so I'm clear, um, the only option is that don't want to come in to postpone their hearing at, at the moment yes I, I know in the last day or so some of the assessor personnel um, have indicated uh, to the clerk of the board that they would like to see remote hearings available um, okay and I think All we right. just heard about that in the last day or so so because I mean I would imagine you know times are changing right I mean I would prefer to come in person personally too but as things progress, we have no we have, viruses are the load is in, the cases are increasing. We have no remedy. Um, I could see how many people would be nervous about coming in. I want to make sure that we're able to offer all we're able to accommodate all requests. So we will continue working on this, okay, Ms. Berkman. And oh, one more thing, they, they must sign a waiver. Taxpayers must sign a waiver if they do not. Uh, come in is that right so when we when when we set them for hearing um they get a first hearing notice that asks them to confirm whether they're coming to the hearing whether mm -hmm. they want to use a first postponement as a matter of right or mm -hmm. whether they want to do a second and supplement postponement mm -hmm. um you know or if they have a stipulation on file and if they do if they've reached a value stipulation with the assessor they don't need to come in because uh, those are reviewed without the parties unless the aab needs more information so they get their first postponement as a matter of right, but a lot of times applicants will want two or three or four postponements because they haven't gotten themselves ready yet or it's not convenient. And under Rule 323, those they have to sign a waiver of the two-year statute when they request a second or subsequent postponement. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. This has actually been a really enlightening conversation. I appreciate your, your comments. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'm all done. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> With that, we'll move on to our next
uh, topic with the Mid-City Counties, and we have two speakers for that. We'll begin, uh, and this is for the authority for remote AAB hearings. We'll start, actually, we're going to invite back uh, Kareem Gonzalez, Deputy Clerk, Board of Supervisors for Sonoma County. Is Ms. Gonzalez available? I am. Thank you, Chair Vasquez and the board for welcoming me back. Um, I, I'm going to keep this as brief as possible because I don't. I, um, I, I don't want to repeat what uh, previous speakers have stated. Um, I agree with uh, Mr. Parker from uh, Los Angeles County. Even though we are a mid-sized county, I think that the. Uh, I want to echo the sentiments that, you know, statutory regulations and having consistency from the BOE um, regarding um, most most uh, importantly for our county uh, and for me in particular is early document production or um, the evidentiary timeline when we can release documentation, how are we going to receive it, how are we going to organize it. I know what we've been doing so far, which I stated earlier, which is through a, a cloud-based system and then simultaneously releasing the evidence to all members. Um, Ms. Berkman brought up a really good point um, that there are rebuttal docs that are submitted in the middle of a hearing. Through Zoom, we are able to do a screen sharing, although we haven't had to do that yet. I can anticipate that will occur, I imagine, in September when we have a pretty heavy evidence uh, document hearing. That being said, uh, I also would like to um, have some some rules or or clarification on administering the oath. I can tell you it's one thing that I didn't speak of earlier. How we've been administering the oath is every panelist, anybody who will be giving testimony, obviously will be administered the oath. Once I give the oath, I ask that it be affirmed. And then I stop and I stop and ask the question, is there anyone who answered in the negative? And, and then pause and wait for anybody to be able to, uh, to answer. And I haven't had that so far. I, we've run this past two of our county councils. And so far, we don't think that there's going to be an issue, but clear guidelines regarding administering the oath um, would be would be wonderful also um, to have. Um, I don't think that I have anything anything additional other than um, if needed to extend the two year um, extension from January 31st um, forward because we don't know where we're going to be come January 31st. I mean, I like many other counties have seen, have applications that are or appeals that are going to be expiring January, February, March, April, May, June. And what do we do with those other than schedule additional hearings where our board members may not be present, may not be available. Um, all of our board members live in this county. This county is, um, is again, I repeat in, um, you know, in a state of emergency as I, as I speak to you today, um, all are unlike Ms. Berkman, Sonoma County um, has uh, held held our held our hearings and held them all remotely. Our taxpayers, assessors, and our board members have all requested time and time again to keep the hearings remote. Um, there are many taxpayers that I've spoken to, either be, via email or phone, who have have stated their fear of coming in and actually having a physical hearing. And so that they are, they're quite pleased that we are holding remote hearings. The demographics of our board members are of a higher risk, except for one board member. And they would still prefer that we all hold our, that we hold the hearings remotely. Uh, I do not have any other, any other questions or any, uh, any discussions further. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. No, thank you for your insight. Members, do we have any other questions? Hearing none, we will go on to our next speaker. And actually, we're bringing back uh, Ms. Julie, and I believe it's Dockler, right? I think I pronounced it wrong last time. Senior Deputy Clerk, Board of Supervisors for Yolo County. 
of Yolo County. Yes, this is Julie Dockler, Senior Deputy Clerk with Yolo County Board of Supervisors, and I just want to thank you for allowing me to again address you today. As other speakers have stated, I also appreciate on this whole issue. We're in strange times, and so it leads to opportunities and also some um, interesting outcomes here. So hopefully, you know, we can all work together and come up with solutions. So um, I do concur also with many of the other speakers about having state guidelines that would provide consistency. And um, I don't have a whole lot to add, but I do have a few things that I think might be important that the BOE should focus on. Um, first, um, it, I believe that question has been answered, but are we allowed to hold evidentiary hearings in a virtual setting? Um, and then the second one is um, our virtual hearing notice waivers required which some county assessors are requiring. I received something from um, an agent and it was an agreement that he sent me about waiving in-person assessment appeal hearings. Um, the agent explained to me that it seems some county attorneys believe that section 1607 and 1610.2 make reference to personal appearances. They are of the belief that at this point in time, online hearings may conflict with these two sections of the code. Since this is a legal opinion, it seems that every county may have a different interpretation of these sections, but a number of agents in the southern region of California are insistent upon having the hearings in person. So I just wanted to bring that up. Um, and then third, um, it would be helpful if the BOE could provide standard or sample language of what to place on hearing notices and scheduling virtual meetings and also perhaps sample language in which clerks can send to taxpayers who wish to address the board and how they can provide evidence. Um, also something I was just thinking about as people were speaking is that, um, you know, it might be helpful to in the future um, to keep remote hearings as an option, even when we can return to in-person meetings. Um, sometimes I think one speaker mentioned about some of the uh, taxpayers, it's actually very convenient for them to just be able to be where they are and then attend the hearings. So it would be nice if we could do some sort of a hybrid, I guess, approach, um, perhaps doing in-person meetings and then allow those who wish to attend via Zoom or other platform um, could also do that going forward. So that might be somewhat of an opportunity and may get through some of the appeals um, faster. Um, we're very lucky here in Yolo County that um, we are able to continue to conduct our meetings. Um, we are able to do it from our office, so we do have equipment available that helps us to, um, you know, conduct the Zoom meetings in, a, in an efficient manner. And um, we've had practice. Um, we also, you know, conduct our Board of Supervisors meeting, and then we are moderating and also clerking those meetings. So that's been helpful to get kind of that practice under our belt. Um, for counties that may be interested in doing Zoom meetings or other platforms, having uh, mock meetings ahead of time with their members might reassure them that, you know, it's, it's you know, how to, how to run the meetings, how it feels, and, you know, might be an assurance that it is possible to do that. So um, I, um, I really don't have any other comments to add, except I just want to thank you for letting me participate today and, and explain how we in Yolo County are carrying on with our business plan. So thank you very much. Thank you. Members, is there any questions? Um, this is Malia again. Yes, Just wanted to thank uh, Yolo County for their presentation. I have no questions though. Thank you. With that, members, we're going to move into our third area, which is the rural counties. We have one speaker representing the rural counties on guidance and authority to remote for the remote AAB hearings. <clears throat> and that is Miss Melanie Curtis, Deputy Clerk, Board of Supervisors from Kings County. Welcome back. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to give some information um, from Kings County. And this is once again, Melanie Curtis, Deputy Clerk to the Board of Supervisors, who also sits as our Board of Equalization. Um, I don't care to reiterate uh, things that have already been stated multiple times. I believe we have many of the same concerns, especially of the last, the, the previous four speakers. So I don't want to belabor those points. But there are a couple of examples and concerns that I would like to bring forward based on the one um, hearing that we did hold in our chambers recently. 
and my concern has to do with our current format of this this hybrid process. So because we did require the principals involved to be in chambers in person but limited the number because of the small size of our chambers, um, the challenge that came forward from the applicant was he was frustrated that he was only allowed to bring one person with him and the assessor's office, which although we had asked to try to keep it to two, actually had three representatives present in chambers, and he um, challenged our decision to allow that to proceed in that manner. Um, I found that interesting because he could have brought one person and didn't and then was complaining he didn't have two, but um, it it did certainly bring up a a due process question there, and and what authority did we have to, to limit um, who was going to be in chambers and, and, and how we determine who, who comes in and who doesn't. Um, so some guidance um, and some, some training on these types of issues would be greatly appreciated. The other concern that I have is um, our board is very old school. They want to do everything in person, and so everything that they can do in person they have done, and um, with the exception of one member. So I have four members in chambers in person and one participating through WebEx. And the concern that I have in terms of due process is our applicants are entitled to a hearing of the full board. Is one member participating remotely adequate to, does that suffice to fulfill that requirement? Uh, so those were the, the two things that came up for me during our hearing that I was concerned about and, and I could see um, being a challenge moving forward. Um, we don't have any ch- any plans at this point to uh, to change this hybrid model, but we are open to working with taxpayers who do request um, remote hearings for health reasons. We also are hoping that we can basically just postpone those hearings until a time that we can move forward in, in, in a more normal manner. But assuming that we are at this for quite some time, certainly additional guidance, guidelines, training, and tools to deal with the challenges of evidence and who can and can't be in chambers would be very helpful. And I have nothing further at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Members, do we have any questions for Ms. Curtis? Hearing none, we will go ahead and move into our next two speakers, uh, which representing the taxpayers on guidance and authority for remote AAB hearings. And we'll start with uh, Peter, and I hope I don't butcher this, but it looks like Kotschitoff, Kotschitoff, Chair of Meredith California. Yeah, you did. I'm sorry, tax advocates. Yeah. No, you, you got the pronunciation right, and I appreciate that. It's always a tough name to pronounce. <laughs> so uh, I, I do want to thank the board for allowing us to share our views on this important issue. Um, we do think that there are several issues that need to be addressed in order to hold remote hearings. And, you know, as has come up earlier on this call, um, you know, Property Tax Rule 301A says the functions of the board are one, to ensure that all applicants are afforded due process and given the opportunity for a timely and meaningful hearing. So due process is really the primary consideration here. And and I think it's important to note that uh, assessment appeals boards are quasi-judicial courts and the trial is at the board because of the bifurcated appeal standard between substantial evidence on factual issues and de novo independent judgment review on legal issues. So that's why uh, due process and fairness is so important in these valuation hearings. In looking at the current rules and code sections uh, about what might need to be done for, uh, to allow for uh, remote hearings, uh, I do see an opportunity where uh, a definition could be added to rule 301 that would uh, define a hearing as including in-person telephonic and video appearance. So 
Uh, I suspect that if a, a rule amendment was done to Rule 301 to do that, that the rest of the rules and code sections might flow uh, from that, but uh, certainly, um, uh, you know, open to other other folks' interpretations on that. Um, we also think that there need to be some rules to standardize the application of remote hearings across all counties. And we think that this, this process should consider uh, the following items. And, and one question arises is, could value hearings be held remotely while still ensuring due process? And we feel that a, a telephonic hearing all by itself would not afford due process to the taxpayer. So, um, you know, from a value hearing perspective, a telephonic hearing would probably wouldn't work. However, a, a, a video hearing on value may possibly provide due process, but it would require some major audio visual technology upgrades and, and new rules to do so. So if remote value hearings were conducted, we feel that uh, the board should consider you know, the following items. And one would be that participation in a remote value hearing should be optional because all taxpayers may not possess the technological hardware or internet access or ability to operate the technology required for the hearing. Uh, we also think that an important point that others have brought up today as well is that there need to be quality control standards for multi-camera and microphone audiovisual systems on which all AAB members, witnesses, taxpayer, and assessor, uh, assessor representatives are clearly visible at all times by everyone in the hearing and can also be heard. And this sort of reflects on the concern that Ms. Berkman brought up uh, as it relates to Santa Clara County and that it's, it's important to be able to see the Assessment Appeals Board members' reactions. And, um, you know, sometimes when, you know, they're not even the ones speaking. And, and I think it's important to see everyone's reactions to certain points being made and it allows the parties to decide as they're presenting something, uh, you know, whether or not they should emphasize a certain area or focus on something that might be a point of confusion. Um, and one thing I will say is the Santa Clara County Assessment Appeals Board does a very good job with um, fostering open discussion between the board members and the applicants and the assessor during the hearing to eliminate any confusion over the data being presented. So. Uh, you know, that type of interaction is critical to, uh, success, to a successful hearing. And, um, you know, if we are doing value hearings, we really do need to have, uh, in our opinion, state-of-the-art equipment to facilitate that. So an, another point uh, to consider uh, is that, you know, we'd still have to comply with the Rule 313G uh, of making hearings open and accessible to the public. Uh, also, the hearing notice should provide the party's detailed instructions for remote access, as well as for public access of the agenda. Uh, there needs to be some sort of separate audiovisual system for the participating public so that they cannot see the evidence presented during the hearing that may not officially be accepted into the record until the end of the day or the hearing. Um, so that's you know, something to consider. There's also a provision for hearings to be closed to the public due to trade secrets. So the technology would need to accommodate removing the public or other, other parties from the hearing that can no longer be present. And that's under Rule 313G2. Um, also, the audiovisual system must possess suf sufficient security to protect from unauthorized use by hackers. Uh, you know, that's something that, you know, we've all seen kind of come up with Zoom calls. Uh, we'd also uh, think that the uh, clerk of the board or the appeals board would need to have technical staff present to immediately address uh, what we think are ine inevitable issues of uh, technology problems that, that occur during hearings. It's, it's just sort of uh, normal when you're relying so heavily on technology. Um, there also needs to be a process for accommodating the requirement of recording all hearings. Uh, there's also been discussion today about submittal of pre-hearing briefs and hearing exhibits. 
and uh, the appeals board would not, uh, should not have access to those exhibits until they're entered in evidence. Um, there's also needs to be an accommodation for entering uh, those exhibits, uh, not only the, the pre-submitted exhibits uh, into evidence during the hearing, but also any exhibits uh, like a rebuttal exhibit that might come up during the hearing. A um, uh, couple minor points: we might, uh, you know, need a function to remote uh, to remotely request and paying for findings of fact fees. Uh, process for accommodating a uh, remote stenographer uh, to the extent that that's needed. So those those issues all come up as it relates to value hearings. We do think that there are some hearings that are more easily held on a remote basis, and those would be pre-hearing conferences or status hearings. Acceptable value recommendations, I think, is a, a great idea uh, to move things along that if the assessor and the applicant can come to a resolution that it does not get um, into a log jam and, and we can do acceptable value recommendations. I understand there's a stipulation process, but sometimes that doesn't move uh, super fast. Uh, and then there could be some uh, video type hearings for, uh, or, or I'm sorry, remote hearings for validity hearings depending upon the co complexity. And those three things could really be accomplished with a telephonic hearing. Uh, so whether we do move towards remote hearings on a video basis or not, uh, I do think in the short term we could accomplish, you know, moving the ball down the field on a few of these items uh, with telephonic hearings. Um, but again, I don't believe that uh, value hearings should be done telephonically. So some overall points to consider, you know, there. You know, are the counties prepared to de dedicate the personnel and technical training and financial resource to create state-of-the-art audiovisual systems necessary to provide fair hearings to all parties involved? And you know, that's that's really a, a local budget question. Um, are the counties prepared to dedicate resources to operate two systems for value hearings, basically remote and in person? So, in summary, our view is that some hearing functions can be done remotely. Value hearings will be quite difficult um, and require a lot of uh, cost and effort to do so. Uh, however, uh, you know, there may be some sort of uh, hybrid where you know, smaller, less complex cases could be done uh, from, for a value uh, and, and those could be done more easily. Um, the multi-day large complex hearings that Assessor Stone mentioned at the at last, the last uh, or yesterday, yesterday uh, would, would be very, very difficult, difficult to uh, do on a remote on a basis. Remote uh, to answer um, Member Cohen's questions from yesterday about, you know, maybe the greatest challenge to due process, in our opinion, it would be everyone seeing each other in the hearing and following exhibits. <laughs> Uh, in, a, in a meaningful way. Uh, so that, that would be the greatest challenge and the most important issue to solve for. And uh, I think with that, that would conclude our comments and I'm certainly happy to entertain any questions the group might have. Thank you. Members, we're getting some back noise here. I'm not sure where it's coming from. Yeah, sounds like a cute little kid in the background. Yes. Um, <laughs> thank when you. Somebody's living room, I think. Uh, this is Malia. Uh, is there anything further? I mean, other than um, not seeing people, are there technological restraints or constraints that you could speak to? Uh, well, I, I think generally speaking, uh, very few appeals board rooms are outfitted with the technology necessary to accomplish a meaningful value hearing. There are some counties that lever off of their board of supervisors chambers to do the hearings and typically those hearing rooms are outfitted quite well with the audiovisual technology. Mm -hmm. So I, I really do see a situation where, uh, you know, counties that are doing value hearings remotely, uh, you know, would have to 
you know, set up a strong system, uh, generally speaking. There are, like I say, there are some counties that can use their board of supervisors chambers, but again, there's limited availability for those rooms too. So it's not like um, the appeals board can take over that, those chambers on a permanent basis. Um, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. We good? Any other questions, members? Karen and seeing none, we can go on and move on uh, to our second speaker, Mr. Scott Kaufman from the Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association. Welcome back, Mr. Kaufman. Hello again. Uh, and, and once again, I'll, I'll keep it short. P Peter honestly said a lot of things that we think as well. And you know, I want to be respectful of your time, especially with the governor's order to close early. Um, you know, obviously in person is preferred. Uh, there's just a rapport there between, you know, the taxpayer and the board and the assessor. I just don't think you necessarily have digital, but obviously we understand that because of COVID-19 restrictions, even an in-person uh, uh, hearing can't always be done in an equitable, equitable way. You can't have maybe necessarily all the people you'd like to attend and those sorts of things and, and pushing hearings off potentially indefinitely also a question of process and, and you know right to a speedy and timely trial um you know we think at a minimum remote hearings have to be done by video and options for conducting video hearings should be made available Texas doesn't have access to a, a stable video internet connection i just I, I, we agree that telephonically just doesn't make sense and, and present some real due process issues so i think at a minimum if if hearings need to be done uh, digitally because of COVID-19 and you know, it's continued uh, and the continued issues stemming from that, that it, it should at least be done uh, by video and, you know, the necessary infrastructure to do that has to be uh, committed to. And with that, that's pretty much it. I'm happy as well to answer any questions. Thank you. Members, do we have any uh, questions or comments for Mr. Kaufman? Hearing none, we will go ahead and move into our last category here, which is uh, our speaker representing the Board of Equalization. Uh, <clears throat> and that is uh, Richard Moon, Tax Council. Mr. Uh, Moon. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Vasquez, members of the board. Um, I'll just speak very briefly on, on what we uh, view as some of the authority uh, surrounding uh, remote hearings or the ability to do remote hearings. Uh, both the board and the county uh, and the counties have authority to prescribe uh, rules or or guide how assessment appeals um, are done um, for the board and and also for the counties as well. That authority is quite broad. So, for example, for the board, that authority is that the board shall prescribe rules and regulations to govern local boards of equalization. And and for the uh, for the counties, they have the uh, authority to adopt rules of notice and procedures. Uh, as may be required to facilitate their work. Um, and so under that broad authority, we believe um, that remote hearings um, are allowed, um, especially because there are no specific uh, statutory or regulatory authorities um, that would uh, explicitly not permit um, the remote hearings. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that there aren't many issues um, that need to be worked through uh, or thought about but we do believe that general authority um, is, is there. Um, amongst the many issues um, that need to be considered, not the least of uh, which is are the, all of the due process concerns that many of the speakers uh, had spoken about, um, but uh, there does need to be consideration, of course, of things like uh, the requirement that the hearing be public, except um, for trade secrets and for deliberation. Um, and especially also for um, how the exchange of information may be done. For some of these um, more specific issues um, that may occur as uh, remote hearings are done, um, it may be helpful or necessary to have specific um, legislation um, that allows uh, a, a change to the way that things are done, particularly I'm thinking about uh, exchange of information um, if that's deemed necessary. Um, uh, and, and um, but for uh, the general authority to do remote hearings, um, we believe that that authority um, is there. Um, and although the uh, governor's executive order does uh, talk about 
uh, remote hearings. Um, we don't believe that um, that uh, that uh, authority given by the executive order um, is is even necessary. We believe that authority is there um, uh, absent the executive order uh, as well. And um, I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Members, do we have any questions for Mr. Moon? Hearing that, uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Moon, for your comments. Thank you. Um, I, I think I do have a question. Oh, um, Ms. Cohen, go ahead, Member Cohen. I, I just want to make sure I understand correctly. So, Mr. Moon, you now agree to publicly to a publicly notice convening. Mm. Richard? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I lost you there. Oh, okay. I was just saying, so I just wanted to clarify, uh, to, cl to clarify, um, um, you now, are, you, you now agree to that it is possible to do publicly notice, a publicly notice convening. Uh, of a remote AAB hearing? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I, I do believe it's possible to do that. The authority is there. Um, to for um, either the board or the, or the counties to do uh, remote hearings. And what actions do you think we should be taking? Um, well, I think uh, uh, generally speaking, all of the issues that the speakers um, have brought up uh, will be will certainly be issues uh, that need to be discussed. Um, I think there are several options as to what ultimate um, product or guidance can be issued, um, and those are the ones that um, the board is, is uh, uh, generally um, uh, able to do, such as letter to assessors, um, assessors handbook guidance, okay. um, and then uh, regulations, um, whether that be regular uh, or emergency rulemaking. And Mr. Moon, what uh, would you consider priority issues? Uh, I, I think the, the priority, um, especially given all of the testimony from the speakers today, uh, would be to make sure that all of the due process concerns um, are, are met. And in particular, it seems that there are um, a lot of those issues um, that are uh, related to technical ability. So, for example, um, the ability to see uh, everybody on the screen, the ability to exchange information, um, at the proper time, the ability to, to make sure that uh, you can, if you're doing a video hearing, that your video is not going to go out or that your internet is, is too slow. So it seems to me that um, a, lot of the, a lot of the concerns are surrounding um, you know, the protocols and things that would be in effect um, if a remote hearing was done. And a lot of those uh, seem to be related to, to the technical ability to do the remote hearing. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I have no other questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Members, if there's no other questions of uh, Mr. Moon, I was going to ask Ms. Davis uh, to open up the public comment. I understand we had some people that were on the line or willing to speak, and there might even be some written testimony on this. Yes, we do, sir. Um, AT&T moderator, can you please ask the public if there are any comments on this matter at this time? Thank you. If you wish to make a public comment, please press one and then zero at this time. And I have no one in queue at this time. Okay. Chair Baskin. Mr. Chairman, we do have some written comments that Mr. Nanjo would like to read. No, I'm aware of that. Why don't we go ahead and take those and then we'll get to you, uh, Mr. Gaines. Is that okay? Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Chairman Vasquez, uh, Clerk Davis. Um, I believe Lisa Renati is uh, prepared uh, to read some of these, so I will pass the baton over to her. Ms. Renati, are you ready to read the public comments? I am. I have one public comment. It is it is unidentified and the comment states, AAB hearings should have happened via teleconference, not in person, to ensure public and work, worker health and safety. That ends the single comment that I have. Okay, and then I have an additional comment um, from Ms. Annette Ramirez. 
Um, Chairman Vasquez and members of the board, it is our understanding that your board is considering the development of guidelines to assist county boards of equalization in conducting remote rather than in-person hearings. It is also our understanding that the information regarding the manner in which the San Luis Obispo County Assessment Appeals Board and AAB staff have responded to the pandemic and plan to respond to the future may be helpful to your board in the development of said guidelines. As such, and given that we, are, we strongly support the development of proposed guidelines, we welcome the opportunity to sub submit the following information. The AAB has met only once since the governor proclaimed a state of emergency on July 20th, 2020. The AAB, AAB conducted a limited remote hearing. More specifically, based upon the extension that the AAB obtained from your executive director and pursuant to recent updates to AAB's hearing procedures adopted by the County Board of Supervisors, permitting use of alternate meeting procedures during exigent circumstances, the AAB was able to limit its July meeting to non-hearing items. Example, approval of waivers of time and withdrawals and to have everyone participate via Zoom or telephonically. A copy of the agenda uh, is available um, and they give the um, location. Although AAB staff would prefer that the AAB meetings continue to be held remotely, we have concerns about unilateral development of adequate procedures to ensure due process given the quasi-judicial and evidentiary nature of AAB hearings and various provisions in the Revenue and Taxation Code that attendance that address attendance requirements. For example, Revenue and Taxation Code 1610.2 requires the assessor to attend all hearings in person or through a deputy. As a result, the notices of hearing that the clerk issued in connection with both the AAB's upcoming um, August 26th and September 15th meetings indicate the hearings will be conducted in person but in accordance with certain special procedures and requirements. For example, face coverings must be worn at all times Applicants must wait outside their chambers for their application to be called. All exhibits must be submitted in electronic form. The AAB's July meeting agenda uh, includes a staff report regarding the impacts of COVID-19 on AAB proceedings that provides more detail related to the decision to conduct in-person hearings. See page eight of the agenda packet and special procedures and requirements to be employed. See page 27 of the agenda packet. If there is any additional information that we can provide to assist your board in development of guidelines to increase the ability of AABs to conduct remote hearings consistent with due process and other statutory requirements, please let us know. Thank you. Annette Ramirez, Deputy Clerk, Clerk to the Assessment Appeals Board. Um, Erica Stuckey, Deputy County Counsel, Counsel to the Assessment Appeals Board. Um, and then... Mr. Nanjo, I have Katherine Kramer. Okay, go ahead. Catherine Kramer writes, August 18th, 2020, California Board of Equalization Board meeting subject, Prop 60, extension of two-year turnaround time selling a house due to complications with COVID-19. I am an over 60 California homeowner seeking help with extending the two-year time frame to sell my Oakland home and be able to apply for tax benefits described in Proposition 60. Due to COVID-19, I have experienced an all-out stop and now slowdown for being able to find contractors repair and remodel my home in order to bring it to market with it within the two years allowed. 2020 has been a very difficult year to proceed with all aspects of my home project. I understand that a California constitutional change will be required to increase this time allowance. I assume that when the two-year period was originally accounted for, that amount of time may have seemed doable. Times have changed. I have lived in my 1937-era home for 28 years. It is my first home purchase and has never been remodeled. I could not afford to remodel. With some proceeds from my parents' home that was sold in 2016 and, and lost out on Prop 60 benefits, I began to consider how to remodel. For today's housing market, I must update outside and inside plus newer expectations of window compliance, sewer, lateral compliance, and sidewalk repairs. My home is my first home purchase. I needed to move out at the end of 2018 so that I could begin to repair my home. I am running out of time. Even if I had an additional six months, I think my project could be completed in time. As it is with COVID-19 and home replacement needs due to California wildfires, home repair and replacements on a large scale are absorbing normally available workers. Finding local contract workers has been very difficult during COVID-19. Thank you for considering this constitutional change. There are so many urgent and important issues currently requiring California's attention. Yet it is my hope that this potential time change is not lost within the many government concerns. 
This time change would make a huge difference to me and my future ability to live smoothly into retirement without fears of tax burdens that could prove to be outside of my financial capabilities. Thank you for consideration. Catherine Kramer, Oakland homeowner. And that should be all the public comments that we have received. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Gaines. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair Vasquez. And I'm just trying to reflect on our our meeting today and um, seems to me that we ought to be taking action on developing regulations for remote and virtual meetings and um, addressing the due process issue. And um, there were some great comments by our speakers um, uh, speaking to code issues uh, 1607 or 1610 with regard to conflict and um, make sure that we're handling the administration of oath properly. Also, Peter uh, Koshloff um, from CADA mentioned um, an amendment to Rule 301. And um, so I think um, I think this board ought to take uh, action and move forward. And it would be nice um, for um, Brenda Fleming to um, digest all this and develop a timeline uh, for when regulations can be uh, set up. Um, there's just a, a lot of in influences uh, that are combining right now, whether it's the uh, pandemic or the recession um, and how that will Im impact uh, property values, especially in the office and retail arena. And yet uh, we have the opportunity to use technology uh, that perhaps can speed up the process, um, but always challenged by due process and making sure that people are being treated in a fair manner. And um, of course, we wanna make sure we have a coalition developed uh, for developing these regs that should include taxpayer groups and the California Alliance of Taxpayer Advocates the California Association of Assessors and the California Association of Clerk and Election Officials and others, I'm sure. Um, but I just, um, that's my synopsis and I'd love to hear from my board members and from you and uh, specifically Chair Vasquez and thank you for bringing this to the forefront so that we can be uh, educated and brought up to date on what the challenges are that lie ahead. Thank you. Uh, Member Cohen, I believe, has some comments. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to just second um, recommendations that I think, Mr. Chair, you're going to be making a few, and then Mr. Gaines has actually been inc incredibly engaged on this. Um, it's been really good to hear your thoughts and, and, and uh, to work with each and every one of you. I think that we've a uh, very informed presentations both today and yesterday. Um, clearly, we need to provide some guidance uh, regarding the protocols to promote hearings, including the technologies, um, most importantly, making sure they're working. Uh, and, and I want to make sure that we are ensuring time and submission of evidence and the sharing of documents, parties, um, addressing these issues of viewing witnesses and judging the credibility of witnesses, that's real. That's a real thing um, that I'm pretty sensitive to. Uh, I'm sure that we've got timely notices uh, going out, especially when supplemental documents and evidence is introduced. Um, maintaining security, encryption, um, so that these documents that are submitted are, uh, their integrity is, is protected. Um, um, also, we need to find ways to address access to technology. We heard this access to technology for those who are unfamiliar um, and, and, and living in really remote, unconnected technologies. There's always been a divide, particularly in the rural counties. I think about my own travels up in the northern part of my districts, connectivity um, um, and Wi Fi is a big deal and um, some members i agree that we need to immediately provide guidance 
to our assessment appeals board, as well as to our assessors. So chair, I just wanted to um, publicly affirm that I'm eager to move forward and um, happy to work with you all on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me take a stab at a motion and see if we can at least begin uh, moving forward. Uh, <clears throat> you know, based on the volume of testimony and recommendations presented to us over these two days and the pending January 31st, uh, 2021 deadline, I'd like to move that we set up a collaborative statewide pandemic continuity of AAB operations work group consisting of five areas. Uh, the first one being uh, putting, let's say, four county AAB representatives, two BOE staff representatives, uh, two board members uh, representatives, uh, one assessor and one taxpayer representative. This working group or work group uh, goal would be to develop an outline or action plan for establishing and addressing the challenges to bring it to the board uh, and said, well, actually, you know what? <clears throat> we can just include it in our <clears throat> next meeting or we need to do a special meeting. We could do a special meeting before the September meeting with the outline or action plan, which would identify basic challenges and options to be addressed, such as submission of evidence and exhibits uh, for equality, <clears throat> for equity of access, technology training, producing accessible hearing records, uh, two in-person safety standards for mid-sized and rural counties who continue to use uh, physical uh, facilities, three, the BOE rule changes needed, <clears throat> new LTAs and assessors handbook revisions. And then the last area I was looking at was the BOE clearinghouse function, ensuring statewide shared information and communications, general standards for uniformity of operations to protect the basic interest of all parties and counties, et cetera. Second. It's been second. <laughs> Any thoughts from the members? I know it's a lot to take on, but you know, I, I think we have some very good experts that testified these last two days, and I think we need to take advantage of them. I have a comment, uh, Vice Chair Schaefer here. Yes. Uh, yes, Schaefer. I've been, been very encouraged by everything that I've heard. Uh, uh, I hate to keep bringing up the idea, but I have a little trouble hearing people through a uh, uh, cloth mask, uh, a little bit muffled, and uh, uh, I understand the legislature uh, allows people when they're speaking to not have a mask or maybe use a plastic mask like uh, I came to work with on today. Uh, you can hear people beautifully through a plastic mask. Uh, I would like to always know that they're not going to require a cloth mask every time somebody speaks because it's difficult for sometimes for the hearers to do it. They should have the upper, the option of the plastic mask being available or have a, a, a exemption from the mask while they're speaking. Uh, I've mentioned that before and I mention it now and I'm very impressed with what uh, Chair Vasquez has had to tell us today and comments of uh, both Ms. Cohen and, uh, and uh, Member Gaines. Uh, I feel I've learned quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Vasquez? Yes, yeah, so Ms. Stowers, go ahead. Thank you. Um, it sounds like what you, your motion is a really heavy lift and will take some time. And especially when you're talking about regulation or rulemaking, it could take up to a year. And based on what um, our legal staff has said, um, the assessment appeal boards already have the authority to have these remote hearings um, through the executive order. So I think it might be more um, beneficial to do a, a two-prong approach. Um, have some type of convening with the parties that you name to work out um, some guidelines through an LTA. And that could be something that we, we can get done immediately. And then the second prong would be to look for a statutory change so that the AABs can permanently conduct remote hearings. Sure, you know, I kind of put all this in, into one. Uh, 
but I was kind of envisioning that this working group that we put together, you know, would make those decisions, but uh, I'm, I'm flexible. Chair Vasquez? Uh, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Gaines. Yeah, yeah Member Gaines, I uh, really appreciate uh, Member Stowers' uh, comments. I think that uh, addresses the issue long-term and in the short-term too. And um, so I, I think that, I just wanna reaffirm uh, her statement and I think it's a good good pathway. Member Cohen, did, did I hear your voice back there? Yeah, you did. I just wanted to speak to make Member Schaefer's concern about like face coverings. I mean, in the end, listen, the law, the executive orders, these health or executive orders, you have flexibility on what the face cover will be. I don't think that we could require that they wear plastic ones, right? But um, I too have a hard time understanding people when they're when they talk and that their faces are covered. Uh, but you know, I don't know if that is enough to prohibit us from moving moving. I don't know. Uh, technology will continue to advance. I, I just don't know the answer. I but I, I appreciate. Um, Member Schaefer's concerns. I think that they're actually very real, um, and 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 even in talking with my own parents, <laughs> when their faces are covered or my face is covered, and I'm talking to them, it's really hard to understand them. So I am sensitive to that, particularly when you talk about um, also the senior population may have trouble hearing, may rely on um, the reading of the mouth. I have an aunt that has a that has uh, a hearing impairment, and so these men have been made it very difficult for us to have FaceTime conversations and to conduct just even family social conversations. So I want to uplift what you're saying, Mr. Schaefer, and I, and I, I agree, but um, we're going to, and we're also going to balance, uh, try to balance. I'm excited by your motion. Um, Ms. Stowers, I like it. I like what you're saying. So just help me think this through a little bit further. How do we, how, how to, if at all, I mean, you were talking about a two-pronged approach, right? I yes. That correctly? You, absolutely. And I'm, I'm just talking off the top of my head right now. So, but I think that to, to, to move forward and to really take some action, the individuals that um, Chair Vasquez's name could start um, there with the prong one and, and basically drafting the LTA letter to assessors or into the AABs on how we will conduct these remote hearings and and to have that working group start working immediately without trying mm -hmm. to hold another BOE meeting to do it in an open session. I know we like everything to be open and transparent, but I'm concerned that if we if we try to put it in a BOE meeting in, in September, it's going to delay the process and then it's going to um, be a burden on BOE staff to um, have two meetings in September. So I'm concerned about that workload. Okay. So I think if we can do the LTA immediately, the group working together, and then of course the LTA will, uh, and let me put that in there, the LTA will require board approval. So that we're, you don't we're think that we should be doing this open session? You don't I, I, think open the, session? I think the, the, the discussion of LTA can be open session, but the, the detail and all, all the makings of the sausage, <laughs> I think that can go offline. <laughs> okay, just to be honest, and then bring it back to, to the board for approval. So my only concern is, is that um, we may be missing out or excluding um, I mean, I think we need to convene people. We need like like the hearings that we that we've had today. I mean, like there people need to weigh in. I don't want to be ex I don't want to be seen or being exclusive um, or after for one group or the other. Even in of expediency, I really think that we should be thoughtful about our transparency. I I hear you. So let's let's just try this way then. Let's have a interested party stakeholder meeting that's open to the public, and anybody who would like to participate can participate. It's not part of a board meeting, but they, you can still have a larger group of individuals providing input on how 
these remote hearings should take place. Well, doesn't that, but won't that prohibit from board members being able to uh, participate because we have to notice? Yes, notice. it would. Oh, well, that's a problem too. That's the problem. So you're saying that you want all, you want to be a, a board meeting. Okay. So, so um, I, 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 I respect that and I, 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 and I won't object to having it as a board meeting. I just want it to move forward. Right. Want us to take right. I, I agree. I'm ready for action too. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Member, <laughs> Member Cohen, uh, since you're all excited, why don't you join me on this and let's get together. And Absolutely. If, and, and if it means uh, we can do at least some preliminary stuff beforehand, let's do it. But I, I understand where you're coming from. So, but I also hear from say the this? staff. Also, also, so I'm going to say I'll, I will be doing a lot of work via proxy through John Fiella and Regina Evans. I'm eight and a half months pregnant. I, I, respect, I know. Weeks. <laughs> so, but this is urgent. I don't want my situation <laughs> to um, preclude us from moving forward. So, but so you will, if you if you don't directly, you will be hearing from uh, my senior staff members. Not a problem, members. Right, members. members of Members, if I may, this is Brenda Fleming. Um, thank you. This is a great discussion. Um, I fully appreciate it. And again, thank you to all of the uh, the speakers who participated in the dialogue. Um, I am totally on board with the the necessity and the urgency, um, the importance of focusing on this issue. But if I may, I think a couple of things. One, I think if we want to do something, you know, timely, um, based upon you know what's going on with the January 31st deadline with the executive order and clearly the demand that we're hearing from from the AABs today, we to move timely, allowing staff to take some of this work offline to do a draft or at least the beginnings of an LTA. I think is a more expedient way for us to get there. We've got enough information from what we've heard today and some experiences to at least be able to come up with the initial draft and offering what an LTA would look like the other option there. and then we can get something put together like I said quickly we could then come back to the board at the September 22nd meeting um, at our regular meeting and just make it really the priority at that time to get the board's approval to the extent that we use the interested parties process it certainly to your point will definitely gives us an opportunity to have a broader range of participants and stakeholders engaging in that dialogue but our interested parties process actually takes longer because included in that process is a certain, the process itself defines certain timelines to send out information awaiting for people to reply to it. Um, and as you know, the, the broader the audience, the larger the pool, certainly you want to give everybody more time to vet and discuss the issues. So typically an interested parties process, we would be looking at a minimum of probably six months before we could respond. I think for expediency, the best approach for us at this point would be to come up with the LTA and again, I'm more than happy, my pleasure to work with the chair and, and um, member Cohen to flesh out these details so that we have something that, um, that incorporates, you know, the priorities and all that we've heard today. But then we, could, again, could come back at the September 22nd meeting and then and have the more of the public discussion on it. Then we could finalize it still uh, within the September time frame. The concern that we have is I've also got to protect that there's some other priority workload that we're also focusing on that I know is equally important to the members. Um, and other work by constitution and statute that we can't fail to perform. Um, and so just trying to have, you know, have um, some other work, another meeting on top of that, I think the better use of the resources um, and the use of, and the best use of our time at this point would be allow us to go offline, do an LTA as a draft, bring it back to the board for your approval, um, and then we could proceed with a subsequent portion of this, which is um, it sort of incrementally we could add additional elements of, of guidance. Um, as needed over the next couple of months. But it gets us something right away so we can start pronto on working on an LTA if the board um, would support that. And if you have any questions, my staff and I are online too. Member Vasquez? Yes. Uh, Vasquez, sorry. Member Cohen, go ahead. Yeah, I again, I just uh, want to reiterate, I like the idea of the LTA for quick action and then we can follow up uh, with the uh, subcommittee uh, that would have the um, all interested parties. Thank you. So you were the second of my motion. So we will, well, you're saying we <clears throat> we run the LTA and then we move forward with uh, the motion. 
And, yes. And I'll work with uh, Member Cohen on this. Well, I should say, I guess her staff, because she may or may not be with us. Uh, there you go. Yeah, and so that's just included in the motion. Is everybody good with it? Can you kind of restate it so I'm clear? I, I'm going to go ahead and reread the motion then. Uh, basically, um, uh, the motion is to uh, set up this collaborative statewide pandemic continuity of AAB operations working group, which would consist of four county AAB representatives, two BOE staff uh, representatives, two board members, uh, one assessor, one taxpayer representative. And the mission or the goal uh, would be to uh, the submission of evidence and exhibits for equity of access, technology training, producing accessible hearing records, two in-person safety standards for mid-sized and rural counties who continue to use physical facilities, three, the BOE rule changes needed. Uh, and I guess that kind of ties into the LTAs we're looking at right now. And then the fourth one would be the, to, for the BOE to be the clearinghouse uh, function, ensuring statewide shared information and communications general standards for uniformity of operations to protect the basic interest of all parties and counties. So that includes the LTA. Well, I'm good if we wanted to break that piece out. That's could what you, I could we could we could you break it out with the LTA taking place first as well, our, we'll our media priority? Before, and as we can, this is this is my hesitation about the LTA ro ro role. Is that I think we as a board have done a great job in 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 establishing our important role in the state of California, and if we defer to the LTA to the executive director staff, I feel like we are relinquishing some of our our authority, some of our power by directing to the executive director to move in this. Direction. So that's also part of my hesitancy. I think that the board needs to remain in the driver's seat and not executive. Staff. And then I'm sensitive to the comment that um, Ms. Fleming said, saying, hey, listen, she's like, hey, we're on board, we're with you, but just keep in mind that we got other constitutional functions that we're also hearing. So balancing all this, balancing pandemic, balancing heat advisory, shutting down offices at three o'clock, like it really puts a really tough um, uh, restraint on, on the executive staff, one that I'm, which I'm like really insensitive to. And um, I think that we should own this, our staff. Um, and that also guarantees uh, publicly noticed meetings um, transparency it allows us the flexibility um, to meet with stakeholders, those that we know of and those that we don't even know of that have met that will manifest through many of these conversations. So that is why I'm not so open to the LTA um, route to helping us address this uh, matter. So it well, sounds like you want us to leave it intact the way the original motion meant. I would prefer that. Thank you. I, okay, I think you're going to run into a problem, though, because you're going to have a lack of clarity on what the counties can do while you're crafting uh, the solution uh, through regs. And so if that takes six months, um, what is the, where, where is the clarity uh, being provided to the 58 counties in terms of what they can or cannot do? And, in, re in relation to remote and virtual meetings? So I'm not really recommending um, uh, refs. I, um, I, I know that we'll get there. Uh, you know, I don't, I, you know, I guess I don't have a real strong answer for Mr. Gaines. <laughs> Members may offer this. Um, I absolutely hear what you're saying. I think ultimately, though, the guidance is still going to come in the form of an LTA. I okay. think what we're vetting is really what the approach 
to get there. Because even if we're working through the, the work group, which I, I understand, the, absolutely understand the benefits of the work group, but ultimately the guidance comes in the form of an LTA, unless you're coming back to say, then it's going to be through regulation or through statute, et cetera, which is a longer process. So my reasoning for the LTA was to get something out there, because I think from the discussion I'm hearing, there's, there's some urgent need to get something there. And perhaps what the discussion is, is, you know, how, how broad scoped or how, you know, what's the level of detail and what's the level of guidance that we would provide in the LTA. But even if we go with the work group, the guidance comes back at either in the form of an LTA or we're moving forward with regulations, which again, uh, or statute, which definitely is a longer process. Thank you for that clarification. You've actually helped clar clarify my thoughts a little bit, Ms. Fleming. So colleagues, what I'm re recommending, I am recommending an LTA. I'm, I, I, we're not abandoning that. I do recommend an LTA. I think the process to get there is what I want to make sure that the, bo the board own, that we own the process to getting there. Um, and, and once we identify the issues, we will direct the executive director um, to issue an LTA. Exactly. Correct. Okay. So I guess right. the question is, do we do that at the September meeting, the regularly scheduled September meeting, or when would you be thinking that this work group would be established? Well, I was kind of thinking, one, if, if people are comfortable with the original motion, let's move it forward. Uh, I will sit with uh, Member Cohen and staff, and let's see how quick we can move this. Yeah, Chair Vasquez, I'm comfortable with that. You good with That's that? Fine. I think we've had enough discussion on this that there's enough clarity. Thank you. Okay, I, I, I actually agree with that too. Um, so here's 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 a preview. There may be a special meeting coming in the near future. There yeah, may be. Mr. Schaefer, I I go along with the other. I don't want to have too many cooks boiling the soup. I think we've uh, hit the nails on the head and we're going someplace. Okay, okay. Ms. Okay. Can we go ahead and maybe take a vote on this motion then? I guess. And may I, if I may, members, just one final comment. Then I definitely will need to work with you as to the timing of that, because if you're talking about a, a special meeting before the September 22nd, 23rd meeting um, in, in, in the next couple of weeks, then we almost are looking at um, having a public agenda noticed by Friday of this week. Um, and then I can check offline with, uh, with some of the other details that we'll need to cover to make that happen. So, Sure. Just want to make sure you have the benefit of the full information to make that decision and and and, 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 and including also the impact not a problem we'll do that okay thank you ms davis yes sir would you like for me to call the roll please chairman vasquez yes vice chair schaefer yes Member Gaines? Aye. Member Cohen? Aye. Deputy Controller Sowers? Did we lose Ms. Sowers? No, I'm here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Working group to flush, to further flush out the issue. The end result is an LTA. We may or may not have a special meeting in September, or we may just put this on the agenda for the September scheduled meeting. Exactly. Either way, I'm just working it out in my head. Either way, it's gonna the all five board members will have a role in this guidance. At some point, yes. At some point. Yes. Thank you. All right, so that's unanimous. Thank you all. I know this has been a tough and grueling two days. Uh, and really, really wanted to thank all the uh, speakers. I mean, we had such talented speakers. I learned a lot from many of the experts that came to speak before us these last two days. So I really wanted to uh, express my appreciation. And then of course, of all the staff members uh, within the BOE and then with each respective uh, member staff as well. I know everybody weighed in and participated. I really appreciate it. And, you know, given the situation <clears throat> and this pandemic we're in, I know it's difficult for many of us uh, to function, you know, remotely, but I think, you know, we all did a fantastic job and I just wanted to thank everybody for that.
Ms. Davis. Unless, is there any other comments from any of the members? Vice Chair Schaefer, I just uh, wonder, we're going to close the meeting. I just want to commemorate uh, former President Bill Clinton's 74th birthday today. And 177 years ago, on this date, uh, gold was discovered in California. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Davis, we already took care of all the public comment we needed to, right? That is correct, sir. So officially, we're ready. We're prepared to adjourn. That is correct. We have no more items on the agenda. And just before we adjourn, I, I wanted to adjourn, actually, you know, I know we're experiencing all these deaths, uh, especially with COVID. And the one that comes to mind for me, and I'd like to adjourn in honor of both uh, the mom and the stepfather of one of our mayors in my county of LA in Long Beach, uh, Mayor Robert Garcia, who lost, uh, they lost their battle with COVID almost like a week apart or two weeks apart. So my condolences go out to his family and would just like to adjourn in honor of both his mom and his stepdad. And if there's any other adjournments people or names that people want to include, it's open. And then of course, you know, I like to mention all the others, you know, there's so many folks that we're hearing every day in different counties throughout the state of California all the lives that we're losing through this COVID, you know, it's a very serious uh, virus that you know, we need to continue to take it very serious. And hopefully pretty soon we'll come up with the vaccine and get beyond this. Mr. Chair, I also would like to add just recognition to our men and women that are in the fire service. Oh yes, yes, thank you. The state of California is on fire. I, I'm in San Francisco and can smell the smoke from the Napa fire and know that there's probably about, uh, I think a total of 33 fires burning all up and down the state. Mr. Gaines acknowledging your, your, your district in particular, um, as well as yours, Tony. And yes. um, also there is a strong correlation between the work that we do, the work with, that we do with the assessors and how it goes into uh, fire suppression and fire suppression services. So um, thank you to the men and women that are putting their lives on the line to help put out the fires in the state of California. And with that, I guess we're ready to close out. And, you know, I'm glad you mentioned the fires because I understand one of our staff uh, parents lost their their house to this recent fire. Uh, so our thoughts and prayers or thoughts and prayers are out to all those folks. I know it's difficult these times right now. On top of, you know, COVID, we have these fires now. But with that, uh, what is our official time? It looks like 2.14. Is, so we're officially adjourning this meeting until September. Thank you, everybody. Be safe. All right, thank you. Can you imagine being